So this is our uh, current events guy. In the last two years, he had to do it from a distance. So we're, we're happy to have Bill with us in the flesh. This is you? This is not a hologram? It, it is. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> and uh, I'll be sitting over here trying to think of some uh, smarty pants ways to interrupt you. I'm expecting it. Okay. <laughs> but uh, he always starts us off with a uh, overview as he's a White House correspondent for 19, 17 years. Going on 19. 19 or... Going on 19 years. You know, he's a credentialed guy that sits in the pool and all of that, that kind of stuff. Must get cold uh, with the winter that big in that pool, you know? Yeah, uh, that, that's the... <laughs> <laughs> and, you have and, to explain the pool. Yes, well... <laughs> it's the press pool. It's not actually a pool. Oh, oh! I, I thought all these years it was a swimming pool that y'all hung out in. Yeah, okay. Look, it didn't take Tommy much time at all. I mean, I mean yeah, within the well, first minute. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm a literalist. I don't understand figures of speech, so... Yeah, yeah. That's you right. know, that's, that's the way it goes. So he's going to uh, <laughs> give us a biblical world news, 365 days a year. That's right. Let her rip, Taylor Chip. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Tommy. Always a pleasure. Uh, always great to be with you all. And Another great introduction there. Yeah, it's, uh, it's vintage, vintage Tommy. <laughs> I'm just getting ready for his uh, insight. It'll come soon. But... Uh, um, we're living in amazing times, as you all know, and uh, much is happening. And I'm going to do what I can to kind of connect some dots for you uh, tonight. And then any questions you have, I'd be more than happy to uh, answer those. Uh, we're living in a time that is so fast and quick. Uh, when I first started doing this 23 years ago here in Dallas uh, with Watch.org, uh, you know, we might have four or five biblical events at the time that were happening that were prophetically significant. Uh, but today, everything that the Bible speaks of, uh, as far as signs of the end times, they're all in play. And uh, they're now playing off each other, which is very interesting. You know, you have a kind of a picture of what to watch because of God's handbook. Uh, but then it's interesting to watch how every one of these areas of focus, 10 or 12 final day events, they all have kind of a life of their own, and it's uh, fascinating. So I'll uh, do what I can to share uh, that uh, for, for the next hour or so, and then, um, you know, uh, do the best I can to give you some uh, in insight of what we're watching uh, as watchmen for the state of Israel, and then, uh, you know, any questions you have, I I'm sure there are a few about what's taking place in our nation's capital, uh, also in Israel, and I was telling my wife at dinner tonight, isn't it amazing that three countries that have done more to share the gospel, Israel, or the United States, Britain, and Israel are going through absolute political chaos. Governmental problems in the UK. And, they, you know, some f incredible theologians came from the UK, Spurgeon and Oswald Chambers and many others. And then look at Israel. Uh, they Today, they disbanded the Knesset today, and they're going to have an election, in, the third election in March. And look what's happening in Washington, D.C. as we speak. So uh, I think there's something biblically significant to that. Uh, we had a friend from Belfast, Ireland in, uh, last week, and some of the chaos, the political chaos in the U.K. is just un unbelievable, uh, as well as uh, our country and Israel. So uh, we're living in days that are exciting. Only God knows how it's going to play out because it's getting to that point. But anyhow, um, our website is, for those who aren't familiar with it, uh, is uh, watch.org, um, 365 days of news a year that's biblically relevant. We focus on biblically relevant news. And um, eye to eye, facing the consequences of dividing Israel, is in its uh, third uh, print, or thir excuse me, third edition. Uh, it covers major events. And now we have all of uh, George W. Bush, I mean, George Herbert Walker Bush, Bill Clinton, George Herbert, I mean, uh, George W. Bush, Obama, and Trump administration's first year and a half of office. Uh, we have 300 new pages in the book. I've got a few copies here with me. Uh, 576 pages from the perfect storm when it was sending 30-foot waves into President George Herbert Walker Bush's home when he was sitting in a podium in Spain calling on Israel to give up their land. 30-foot waves were crashing into his home at the very moment. 
not a week later, a month later, a year later. At the moment he's calling for Israel to give up the land they obtained in the Six-Day War, his uh, home had just a little under a million dollars worth of damage uh, from the perfect storm. It was called perfect because a lot of events had to happen for the storm to be of that significance. 127 record-setting catastrophes and events that have happened at the time that we were pressuring Israel to divide their land. Uh, and the greater the pressure on Israel, the greater the corresponding catastrophe. Um, and, you know, 9-11, uh, Hurricane Katrina, uh, Hurricane Harvey, I'll go into details on that shortly. Uh, two largest terrorist, uh, 12 largest insurance events in U.S. history, two largest terrorist events, 14 of the 15 cautious hurricanes, and five of the seven largest tornado outbreaks in U.S. history. You know, you can feel the, the, the fire, the fury of the God of Israel when, when people are talking about creating an Arab state out of Judea, Samaria, and East Jerusalem. You could just feel it. it you know, from watching the news, you get in this Holy Spirit, you can just feel when you talk about touching and redividing the land of, that God gave to the Jewish people, you can feel that fury. Now, most of these events have happened in America because we've been the sponsor of the peace process. But they've also happened in Europe. And we're also getting ready to put out a video clip on the 10 major events that have happened in Europe when they've kind of taken over while we've had presidential campaigns. When they've been involved, it's happened in Europe. Uh, so it's, you just, the, the, there's something special, as you all know, about that land. And no one has the right to divide or create the boundaries uh, in opposition to the boundaries that God has in Genesis 15, 18. Uh, revealed Obama's legacy, um, being at the White House for uh, 19 years in January would be the official anniversary. I had the eight years of George W. Bush, which was uh, enjoyable and then the difficult years of Obama. But this was kind of my uh, catharsis of being able to kind of put, in, put into perspective of what I saw. And I've had a couple Christian leaders said, I'm so glad you wrote this because if you hadn't, we wouldn't have known a lot of these things that have happened. Uh, we can read a lot, we can find a lot, but I, I, I connected a lot of dots in this book to give you an idea of the depth of what happened during Obama's eight years in office. And we'll never get over it. I, I, I don't see how we'll ever uh, recover from those eight years. Uh, if God brings this nation to its knees, maybe we can get beyond that, that damage of eight years. But it's uh, uh, a lot of damage um, that took place. Uh, my opening scripture was Isaiah 520. I think that that uh, says it best. Woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Uh, I work with media, 90-95% of the media, that stands for things that are so diametrically opposed to our scriptures, LGBT agenda, same-sex marriage, abortion, even infanticide, um, uh, unbelievable, illegal immigration, um, on and on. I mean, this is, they completely endorse the platform of the Democratic Party. And I have family members. My mother was very active as a conservative Democrat in Arizona. I have family members that are Democrats. But her party, and she would admit that before she passed, uh, she was not supportive of Hillary Clinton or Obama or what they had done to her, her political party. And they have moved so far to the left into an, a, a position of Im immorality and an endorsement of immorality and standing publicly uh, priding themselves with what they've been able to accomplish. But it's in direct opposition. And I remember being at the White House. I, I can't believe. I mean, we have all these problems, the United States, all these problems around the world, all these challenges around the world, and they're obsessed with promoting LGBT agenda. Anything that uh, uh, Trump or his administration would do against that agenda or the, uh, transgenderism in the military, they would be furious. When we have all these issues, they're focused on this. So, um, the book, Who Influenced and Radicalized Obama. Um, I went into a lot of details about that. Uh, his, white, uh, his white grandfather uh, thought that he needed a mentor. And unfortunately, he picked Franklin Marshall Davis, an, a devout communist from Chicago that happened to have a long-time relationship with Valerie Jarrett's family. You look at the, the twist of how things came together, and unfortunately, um, Franklin Marshall Davis was also a pedophile. And this is who the grandfather selected for a young,
teenager Barack Obama to be his mentor. And that unfortunately led to a lot of other things and led to his position, led to his involvement in LGBTQ, uh, same-sex marriage, on and on and on. Uh, Saul Alinsky, I mean, isn't it amazing? Supposedly well-meaning issue by his white grandfather led to this happening with Barack Obama, influencing his life to the, pe to the effect that he influenced our nation and our world. Um, Muslim apologist, Israel's existence in danger, in Middle East chaos, these are my chapters, U.S. military's cultural destruction, what he did there. LGBT, he owns it, no one promoted it more worldwide than him. Uh, faith on his terms, the convoluted way of looking at scripture for his benefit. Uh, the legacy, will America ever recover? And the final chapter, so help me God understand, so help me God from his perspective, so help me God uh, understand that what I've done, I repent of. Uh, it's wrong. It's in, in opposition to the scriptures. So it's, uh, you know, we all need to repent. As a nation, we need to repent. Uh, the church needs to repent. We all are responsible for this culture that, uh, that he became uh, president in and that we couldn't be more effective in standing up against this. So it gives him a chance personally to repent and ask for God's forgiveness uh, in the So Help Me God chapter. And then uh, his speeches. I used a lot of his own words. Uh, I, I used a lot of his own words just to, it's kind of almost like a parable to a certain extent where you, you, we see when you read the own words, I don't have to say anything about those words. We know what they mean in, in the fact that they're in opposition to God's word. So you don't have to. And I've, I've had uh, even black Christians, black Americans that have come up to me and said, Bill, you really did a good job. You, ha you did not have a bone to pick in this book. You presented it the way it was said, spoken, and meant to happen. And that was the purpose. So uh, being there at the White House, I just had to get this out, and that was the purpose of writing the book. Um, every week we put out a weekly uh, news report on Friday. There's a fair amount of subscribers here, and I thank you for your subscriptions. Uh, it's 18 to 20 pages uh, each week of world news that happened that week that was prophetically relevant. It's kind of a summary. It's real tough to keep it at 20 pages with so much going on. And then just kind of a summary of things I'm seeing. Uh, another guy, uh, Jim Fletcher, helps me with uh, what's happening in the church in America, which hard to believe, but it is. Uh, liberalism, it's part of our battle. When I moved to Dallas, I mean, from Dallas to D.C. 19 years ago, the, the person that discipled me and, and mentored me, he said, Bill, one day our greatest challenge is going to be the other part of the church. We're going to have to, as evangelicals, defend ourselves against them and some of their teachings. And unfortunately, that, uh, that has become true. And um, so we write about that, and then we um, also have a uh, Connect the Dot uh, area, too, that uh, is uh, written by Bill Wilson, does a great job of, of issues that are affecting us in, in our country. So, um, important read, the next 12 months, all major areas in prophecy are in play, we cross the tipping point, unprecedented record-setting events, uh, we know what to pray about. That's the other importance of our, our weekly, uh, our daily posting, and also uh, the news report. Um, you know, sometimes, you know, uh, well, I came up with Eye of the Hurricane because um, President Trump has a very unique way of governing, and at, at, the, at the same time, he has a very significant final day role. And I've talked to some of members of his advisory committee, and I say, sure, a lot of what he's doing is a focus on us here in the United States, but he has such a biblically significant final day role. And I'll go into more details. It is incredible. I mean, this 45th president of our country uh, has been compared to Cyrus. Uh, and I'll get to that just sh shortly. But significance uh, of what he's doing biblically uh, and what he's doing with the state of Israel. Uh, became the 45th president when no one thought that was possible. Uh, he came from nowhere, uh, ran against 16 qualified Republican candidates. Uh, he ran the table in the South that Ted Cruz thought he was going to win because of the evangel evangelicals. He ran the table uh, in uh, the Northeast. Uh, he won uh, primary after primary, and everybody, no one thought it was possible. But this is who God wanted to be president, who allowed to be, allowed to be president at the time, just like he allowed Barack Obama to be president, and Bill Clinton, and George W. Bush. And 
President Trump was his man for, for the hour. Uh, I really appreciate President Trump's reach out to the Evangelical Advisory Council. He likes and appreciates evangelicals. Where George W. Bush was very comfortable with Protestants and Catholics, George, uh, a wonderful man, George Bush, but President Trump has an advisory council. I mean, you recognize a lot of these people here. T uh, Tony Perkins, uh, Ralph Reed, uh, Pastor Jeffers here from Dallas, uh, uh, Jack Graham, uh, Mike Evans, uh, Paula White. Um, you know, it's just incredible. Uh, yeah, a lot of these guys, Robert Morris from uh, out here in uh, Southlake, and uh, he listens to them. And when he goes through a very difficult period of time, uh, they come to Washington to, to be there with him, to pray with him. And, uh, you know, Michelle Bachman uh, has been in, very involved, and they just have a great appreciation for him uh, personally. And, uh, and, and also, there's Mike Evans with his menorah, uh, presenting it to um, President Trump for some of the things he's done for Israel. Um, Trump is a leader in an unprecedented time. Uh, he's a billionaire deal maker. Uh, 508, we have, a, as of about 12 months ago, 585 billionaires in the United States. That's not a lot of people out of 7 billion people in the world. We've got 2,208 worldwide. Uh, that's your old figure, probably changed a bit. Uh, they're unique people. They have an unconventional style. When I was here in commercial real estate in, in the Dallas Fort Worth area for 16, 17 years, uh, I, I worked with some very wealthy developers. Uh, they were unpredictable. Uh, you never knew what they were up to. Uh, they had the end in sight, uh, and they usually got there. But it was difficult. It was difficult as a real estate broker to deal with people like that because they were so unpredictable. And with Trump and his massive negotiations on trade, you don't know what he's going to do, how he's going to do it, but he also operates extremely well in chaos. And I don't think many of us like having chaos in our lives. I think we like it to be pretty easy and normal and predictable. But he feeds off of it. Unique. Uh, method to madness. There seems to be sometimes it's like, <laughs> this is just like really crazy. Why is he doing this? Some, you know, he's on the edge sometimes. But there's, he's a disruptor. It's, he's, he's disrupted the, the swamp in Washington. And uh, as well as those people that want to see Israel give up their land. He's dis disruptive there. So anyhow, uh, uh, unprecedented attacks by the media. 91% of our news is, is negative Trump news. And I have friends, uh, some Jewish friends and other friends. Uh, one particular Jewish friend, uh, we're both big baseball fans. We love going to Washington National Games. But Steve and I uh, haven't seen each other lately because... Stephen's gotten so toxic from watching CNN and MSNBC, and he moved from Northern Virginia over right into the heart of the blue state, Bethesda, Maryland, right outside of, and it, it's just not the same. I mean, it's just unbelievable. Where are you getting your news and how it affects you? And uh, unfortunately, that's the way it is in Washington. 91% of Washington, D.C. voted for Hillary Clinton. 67% in our area, Northern Virginia now, and unfortunately, our state just became a blue, a blue state. Uh, Unbelievable. I mean, our whole, our whole legislature in Virginia now is blue. Even the governor, who is the one pushing infanticide. So, um, but it, nonetheless, this is a political battle on, on, many, on many different planes. Texas has the Californians. I grew up in Arizona. Uh, Arizona is now a blue state. Who would ever thought Barry Goldwater State would become a, a, a blue state? It's the Californians that have moved into Arizona. Uh, so, anyhow, what a time we live. Um, evangelical comfort versus protect Protestant Catholic. I've been literally in three different places where with President Trump spoken uh, back during the campaign with a thousand Christian leaders uh, with the Marriott Marquis in New York. Uh, you know, Mike Huckabee interviewed him. Franklin Graham was there. Jim Dobson, Tony Perkins, and he just really appreciated our support. And he is a believer. I believe that, but he is a very young believer. But I pre when you look at a young believer, who's he surrounding himself with? That's an evangelical group. That's his group that he surrounds with. And that gives me a level of comfort because the people that are speaking into his life know the gospel. They know the word. Um, 
you know, many uh, Christian persecutions, uh, he's, I'll get to that, but he's doing a lot of, uh, in terms of Christian persecution worldwide. He says, why don't we give the money to the UN and then have them funnel? Let's just put it where we need. Let's take U.S. taxpayer dollars and put them into the countries that need it directly through Senator Sam Brownback that through the State Department is putting the funds where they need to be. Um, Mike Pence, wonderful believer. Mike Pompeo, strong believer. Uh, bold uh, believer. I don't know a lot about John's uh, background, but uh, strong. Uh, he was he, uh, very, I think he's Protestant, but uh, so he was a solid guy and helpful to Trump. And then Sam, Sam Brownback uh, uh, loves the Lord, and he's uh, doing some great work. Uh, many accomplishments. This is, you know, his first two years, he delivered on a lot of promises. Uh, 289 in his first two years in office, and a lot more since. Uh, his judicial appointments now up to 185 judges. This is huge because we get killed in the courts all the time as conservatives and as Christians. Uh, this is very significant. Um, 185 judges in the, the federal courts, the circuit courts, district court judges, and two Supreme Court justices. And, um, you know, bless Mrs. Ginsburg. Uh, she's doing everything she can to hang on. I hope she comes to know Jesus as her Lord and Savior. But her motivation to survive right now is so she doesn't give up that seat uh, while Trump's in office because they're, they're going to be a conservative might come in that's more conservative than the other two. Of course, it's your uh, Kavanaugh. So a very interesting scenario. And uh, religious freedom commitment. Uh, Sam, Sam Brambach is the head of the Office of International Religious Freedom, and they're doing great work. Great work. They're having conferences at the State Department. It's, and I'll tell you what, that's a difficult place to operate, the State Department. They are one of the first uh, uh, cabinet seats that took a, got onto LGBT. I couldn't even go. I could just, after a while, I couldn't even go there during Obama's time in office. The spirit was so thick in there. But, uh, you know, with Pompeo being the quality believer he is and Brownback and commitment to this, uh, things have changed a bit. But uh, State Department's a tough place to be. Yeah, the State Department's the one that told Trump that don't, don't move the embassy because if you do, uh, it'll just, every, everything's going to come unloose in the Middle East. And uh, their former illustrious <laughs> Secretary of State John Kerry says the whole Middle East is going to catch fire. And of course, as usual, uh, John Kerry was wrong. It didn't happen. Uh, what am I watching closely? Uh, Trump Middle East deal of the century. I'll go into more details here in just a little bit on that. Uh, Putin, Erdogan, and Rouhani are getting closer and closer in their relationship. Uh, Trump has pr pressured NATO. What happens is the people that are part of NATO, 28 countries, they each are supposed to spend 2% of their gross domestic product for defense purposes. And when he took office, only four, four countries out of 28 were doing it. So when I was at, uh, at NATO with President Trump and uh, his team uh, in uh, May of 2017, uh, you know, the, the big thing there, the big celebration was this new billion dollar plus building that uh, NATO had just built. And Trump and his style came in there and <laughs> immediately, you know, this is supposed to be a celebration of this new billion dollar NATO building. Instead, Trump went in there and I mean, he just ran, went on and on about all these countries that are not providing the money. And he ran it and raved and, you know, just, wow, what chutzpah, you know, to do this. But it, but it was necessary. And since then, $130 billion of additional money have been spent by these countries there are, uh, I think there are 8 to t uh, 10 right now of the 28, and the others are getting really close to, to meeting their NATO requirement. $130 billion in additional money has been spent by these countries to fulfill their NATO requirement because of President Trump. Is that building up the Antichrist army? Thanks, Tommy. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll do that during questions. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Tommy, you're, li you, Tommy, you're a little, you're a little, you're a couple minutes early. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, well, that's a good one, Tommy. Um, so anyhow, uh, U.S. trade wars with China and EU. Um, this is an interesting one. The Chinese, uh, uh, a lady that I know with the CIA, 28 years with CIA, says, you know, it's not by chance that the Persians, the Jews, and the uh, Chinese have survived the centuries because they're that smart. They're very smart people. And, um, you know, with that said, 
this Chinese Sun Tzu art of war philosophy is, is coming up against the Donald J. Trump art of the deal strategy. <laughs> it's very interesting. Uh, probably one thing I would do differently uh, is not, you know, with his bravado, uh, he and Larry Kudlow of, wow, we're tanking the economy, their Chinese market's crashing. You know, Asia's about face-saving. So, you know, if he could frame it a little bit better, that's, you know, he just, this bravado that comes out of the White House sometimes, they just almost like they can't contain themselves. Uh, but they're making headway. Uh, and a lot of people are paying the price right now. Farmers and people in the oil business and other industries, economy still doing well, but it's, this is, this is high level stuff. And I tell you one thing it's done for those that watch. The Chinese had a, were about, and I, from the think tanks I go to in Washington, D.C., the Chinese were about five years away from having their global plan fixed and implemented and in place. And here comes Hurricane Trump. <laughs> it just, they go like, whoa, what came, what was this? What's that? I mean, how do we deal with this? And it was a plan. It was a global plan. How way? You know, moving them into the United States with their 5G, 5G networks where they get access to all our cell phone calls. Uh, the Chinese, uh, and I know this from a, a high-level executive that uh, uh, advises GE and major Fortune 500 companies, the Chinese are into our power grid uh, for, nef uh, for nefarious purposes. Russians are too, but they, they want to do it for the sake of, you know, possibly taking down our power grid one day, to, uh, for uh, also a nefarious purpose, but more so about military, where the Chinese are more about stealing trade secrets. And finding out that companies that want to do business in China with that, you know, 1.3 billion people, that's a big market. Uh, unfortunately, uh, you know, they felt this, this is a way, uh, you know, we want, you want our market, we want to know, you, we want your technology. You want to do business with us, we want, to, we want your patents, and we want to have access to your patents. And unfortunately, it's, it's a pretty bad situation. And, it, and our biggest enemy in the world right now is China, they, they, without a doubt. And Trump has taken them on. Um, China's everywhere. If I have time, I'll get to it tonight. But China's in everywhere. They're work in Mexico and South America. They're in Spain. They're in Germany. They're in Africa with the rare earth. They're they're moving into Iraq for the oil. They're looking at the uh, the rare earth uh, minerals. I mean, Afghanistan has trillions, a couple trillion dollars worth of minerals. It's a very rich country. They're there. They're in Iran. They're down in Venezuela that has some of the highest oil reserves in the world. They've had a plan, they're strategic, they're patient, and their plans are 50 to 100 years out. Ours are like a couple years, by three to five to 10 at best. So they've had a plan. So this has been a very, this is something the United States needed to do at some point. Unfortunately, we have a media in Washington, D.C. is more obsessed about impeachment than they are about the realities of some of these threats that America faces. Uh, and then the Iran conflict, uh, or Trump and the North Korean situation is not getting any better, unfortunately. Uh, the North Korean president used uh, leader used that for uh, uh, photo ops to give him a, a higher level of uh, 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 proficiency or not proficiency but uh, exposure worldwide, and that's uh, and they were very negative about uh, Secretary Pompeo. Um, all false, and then the Iran conflict. I'll hit on that here in just a little bit. So th the good news is tr uh, Trump's uh, Republican approval is still 85 to 90 percent. Uh, and sometimes it's in 90, 90 up to 93%. Um, you know, he says some things that we just wish he wouldn't say. Um, uh, I had a friend, I uh, got together last night with eight friends of mine that have been friends of mine for 40 years here in Dallas. They all live in the Dallas-Fort Worth area. have been friends for 40 years. And one of my friends said, Bill, he said, I've got three sons in high school. And they ask me sometimes, how do you support somebody like President Trump when he says these things? He said, how should I respond? And I said, well, Ted, it's difficult. Uh, you, you, you have to focus on the good things he does, and then really move your sons and family to pray, pray for President Trump to be a little bit more sensitive sometimes about the things he says. Because we forget that. I hear that from time to time from other friends and other people that says, you know, my, my children are going, how do you support someone that says these kind of things? And that's part of the other part problem with our media. We hear about some of those things, and we don't hear about all the good things that he's doing. 
And he's doing a lot of great things. So I also suggested emphasizing some of the positive things he's doing and explain to him a certain extent of what he's going through with this impeachment process. Uh, his handling of pressure has been pretty extraordinary. I, I don't think hardly any of us could have handled what he's been through. Um, difficult situation. Strong economy, record low unemployment uh, for all different uh, ethnic groups. Um, wage gains, first time we've had a significant wage gain in a long time. I mean, they've got companies that are having difficulty finding employees to fill in this good economy, uh, to, to fill the jobs. Uh, we have a massive federal debt, which uh, still hadn't been dealt with. Uh, the hope is uh, the better the economy, the more the taxpayer dollars, the better we'll do against the deficit and reduce it. We're about $23 trillion right now. It's too high. Uh, a friend of mine said uh, the um, Democrats like to tax and spend, and Republicans like to borrow and spend. You know, that's pretty astute. So anyhow, uh, the times are good. I, uh, uh, you know, but at the same time, these are uh, very interesting times uh, and eventually be consequences. This is an example. This, this pic, when I was looking at Mueller in his testimony, I thought to myself, you know, he just really doesn't look very good. And that afternoon, I saw Trump on the, on the South Lawn speaking to the press, and I'm going, what a picture. Who just went through two years of investigations? Mueller... This is the way he looked, bless his soul. Trump, with the pressure he went through, when you put the two pictures together, it's amazing. You'd think that most people had gone through what Trump would gone through, where they would be more like Mr. Mueller. And um, so that's extraordinary. And I tell you, President Trump appreciates the prayers. He does. And I, I'll tell you, that, that evangelical group that he surrounds him with, he couldn't have done it without them and without prayer. He knows that. And when he had a difficult time, like I said tonight, they are on a plane to Washington, D.C., and they're in the Oval Office. And that's happened more than a few times. So um, the 2020 U.S. elections, well, the deep state's getting exposed, folks. We've been hearing about it, but we're uh, fortunately, uh, thanks to Attorney General Bill Barr and the U.S. Attorney John Durham, uh, President Trump, uh, has put the right people in place. Bill Barr is phenomenal. He was on MSNBC yesterday just all but saying, you know, chastising me. In the interview with Wall Street Journal, he said, we've had a three-year false narrative, and look what it's done to our country. Look at the division. Look at all the chaos. I'm paraphrasing, but it was, you know, you get a chance, put Bill Barr MSNBC message or Bill J Barr Wall Street Journal message with yesterday's date, and it was, it was so spot on. Thankfully, we have a U.S. attorney that wants, who loves the Justice Department, who loves our country, who appreciates the FBI, that wants to get, in, in or, get things in order. And uh, U.S. Attorney uh, John Durham, he didn't care if you're a Democrat or a Republican. If you're doing it wrong, you're gonna pay, we're going to come after you. If he's put in charge of an investigation, he doesn't look at the political party affiliation. He doesn't like it when there is not justice. And he's the one that came out right after Horowitz's report was introduced. He said, uh, you know, we have problems with this. You're, you didn't go far, far enough, wide enough, and overseas. Bill Barr and John Durham were in the Ukraine. They went to Italy. They've talked to people face to face. They want to get to the bottom of this. And they don't want it to happen again. So, you know, pray for Bill Barr. Pray, pray for John Durham. They will get behind this in the... Uh, and get the truth out. This is, you know, it's a battle of good and evil. And you know, my wife emphasizes to me, she said, Claudia has said, uh, a large part of President Trump's um, warfare, the warfare that's against President Trump is because of him standing for Israel. <laughs> and that's probably the number one thing. By his things he's done for Israel, which I'll go here sh through shortly, by him standing for Israel, he has been under massive spiritual warfare prime. Number one, because of that reason. Because of what he's done. He has been in direct opposition with the evil forces of the world, uh, the evil forces in the Middle East, the evil forces within the EU and Russia, and because he has stood up against them and hasn't varied. He's been, we've never had a president supportive of, of Israel. Uh, U.S. media bias, we all know that. It's, it's terrible. Not much we can do about it. 
I mean, it's the way it is. 90, 95%. Unfortunately, Fox is changing. Rupert Murdoch's in his final couple years. He's preoccupied now. And um, his sons are pretty uh, more liberal. And Fox is changing. And more and more pro-LGBT people are being put into Fox. Uh, they're sliding on some things. It's changing. I mean, that was one of our... We're still getting some good news out of some of their conservatives, but it's getting more and more difficult there, and it's getting going to get watered down even more because of uh, Murdoch's sons. So um, it, it's, it has a huge factor on people's influence and what they see as truth. Democratic primaries, th there's really nobody that can uh, beat Trump. I mean, there, it's a very weak bench. And uh, that's another reason the Democrats are doing what they are, are right now with this impeachment stuff, because they don't have anybody to, to, to beat Trump. And uh, this is the motivation. My concern is we've got 41 Republicans uh, in 2018 during the midterm election that didn't rerun. And we lost some good folks. I don't know how many of those seats were uh, actually filled by Republican, but they were all seasoned Republicans that just said, you know, I've had enough of this. Or we've had enough of this. They, 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 and right now we have 19 uh, that are not running in the 2020 election and five here in Texas. So that's a concern. Uh, they just, they're just fed up with this. But, you know, if they're not there to help defend, I mean, I don't know who will because it's, it's, it could get worse. And then uh, Russian and Ukraine have been distractions. You imagine the leaders of Russia, or leader of Russia and his people looking. <laughs> you might not have got the election, but look what you've helped create. You know, uh, and the Democratic Party has been there to help create this uh, fiasco that we've uh, witnessed for the last three plus years. And then foreign policy, um, President Trump's uh, foreign policies, uh, unique. The trade policies, uh, the NATO policies, his staunch support of Israel, um, uh, that's disrupted the international order. Another component of spiritual warfare. <clears throat> But Trump and Israel, you know, when he first got elected, people were saying, um, started comparing him to King Cyrus. They were, they, were, they were saying 45th president, we've got Isaiah 45. Well, there's a coin in Israel uh, with Trump and Cyrus, and it's distributed into Israel. And, you know, here's Isaiah 44, 28. They, uh, that saith of Cy Cyrus, he is my shepherd and shall perform all my pleasure. Even say unto Jerusalem, thou shalt be built into the temple, thy foundation shall be laid. King Cyrus said, get out of, move out of Babylon, you can go back to, back to Israel. You can go back to Jerusalem from, from Babylon. And it had a very significant, significant role. And um, Isaiah 45. Thus saith the Lord to his anointed, to Cyrus, whose right hand I have hold, holden to subdue nations before him, and I will lose the loins of kings to open before him the two leave gates, and the gates shall not be shut. Go back. Go back, people of... Uh, go back, Jewish people. Go back, people of Zion. Go back to Israel. Um, uh, and I'll touch on this briefly. Uh, this is kind of an eye-to-eye -eye component. Uh... 2004 and 2005 were very difficult years uh, uh, as far as the major hurricanes, uh, the catastrophes that were happening at the time the Bush administration was very active in the peace process. Uh, 2004, uh, Char Charlie, Gene, Francis, and Ivan uh, were all big, huge, record-setting hurricanes. And then 2005, Katrina, Rita, Wilma, and Dennis. Rita, uh, Katrina began within a couple hours of President Bush being congratu uh, congratulating Ariel Sharon for moving out of, uh, out of the settlements. 9,500 Jews were ripped from their homes in 24 settlements in, in Gush Katif, which is in Gaza and Samaria. And within a couple hours, this storm out of nowhere near the Bahamas just developed into this monster storm. And uh, one thing that uh, they have in common is that they all occur during active, very active peace efforts. George W. Bush was promoting the two states for two peoples in 24 and 2005, and President Trump and his son-in-law, Jared Kushner, the deal of the century in 2017 and 2018. And, you know, I'd written President Trump uh, uh, and his top six people and de delivered eye to eye just like I did when President uh, Bush was in office and warned them, don't, don't touch the land. And um, as much as President Trump is a friend of Israel, the deal of the century has to do with Judea, Samaria, and Jerusalem. And we had, <clears throat> uh, the, you know, the Trump Middle East peace plan. Um, they had meetings in uh, Israel. 
Um, but what happened is in, in, at that time, this meeting here, August 24th, is the day that Hurricane Harvey regathered. Uh, for three and a half days, this little storm off the Gulf, of Gulf Coast, off of Corpus Christi and out, uh, out in the Gulf of Mexico, was, it was history. This storm just was really never even developed. But um, all of a sudden, uh, Kushner arrives in Jerusalem and, and Harvey literally developed instantaneously within 24 hours became a massive rain producer for you know Frank and others that lived in Houston uh, that experienced the floods and I thought wow this is you know I'm just finishing the update of my book and I contacted my printer I said I need the weekend I know you got a tight schedule give me till Monday this is Friday I said I got to do some research on what was going on what was taking place and I go you know what was the administration doing at the time I couldn't come up with anything. I said, okay, where was Kushner? Nothing here. Well, I started reading the Arab press. And I was real familiar with it because I went with President George Bush to the Middle East in 2008. I've been to all the, most of these countries in the Middle East with him, uh, uh, key countries uh, on the Persian Gulf. And sure enough, Kushner was in Doha, Qatar. Kushner was in uh, Jeddah, Saudi Arabia. He was in, uh, then he went to Abu Dhabi, uh, United Arab Emirates. And then from there, he went to Jordan. In Egypt, but it was all secretive. And, and the CBS finally got a hold of uh, the White House and says, "Where's Kushner been?" They, they said, "Well, we, we can't tell you. We, we we don't have any information." They contacted the Secret Service. Where was Kushner? So it was confirmed that he was in those countries meeting with those leaders on the deal of the century. And what Israel was going to do is give up Jude Judea, Samaria, and Jerusalem in a trade for normalization of relationships with the state of Israel. For the sake of Israel, for the sake of them. And sure enough, unbelievable. Um, and then shortly thereafter, uh, Trump was getting ready uh, uh, for, and this all happened during the month of Elul. Um, Elul is a month of repentance and preparation for the highly, high holy days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. Uh, this year's Elul had three record setting category four hurricanes that hit hard two U.S. states and uh, U.S. territory during the Trump administration's extensive Middle East talks pertaining to Israel's land. Um, you had three historical record-setting hurricanes, and that was um, Harvey, Irma, Marie. Uh, Irma developed as Trump was, uh, his administration was preparing for U.N. meetings when President Trump was going to sit down with Netanyahu, Abbas, uh, um, uh, Abdullah and also um, El Sisi at the at the UN and Irma. These were record setting. I mean, these were some of the biggest, most violent storms in the in the Atlantic history. And thanks to the prayer of the saints and people in Florida, they were praying, "Lord, please," because it was heading right at Miami. And if it hit Miami, it would have been it would have been even much bigger than even Katrina. And fortunately, it started moving its way to the west and just went up the uh, Gulf uh, Coast, uh, western part of Florida. But um, they were all pre preparing for this really important meeting at the UN. September 18, uh, President Trump meets with Netanyahu. Hurricane Marie went from a Category 1 to a Category 5 within 14 hours. It's like, that just doesn't happen like this. And he's telling Netanyahu, you, got, you need to meet with uh, El Sisi. You need to work with them closely because we need to move in. We need a, a comprehensive peace plan and we need Egypt involved with this. So within the next 24 hours, uh, Netanyahu uh, met with El Sisi. And then the following day, September 20, um, at the very moment President Trump is meeting at the UN, with Abbas, Abdullah, and El Sisi, Marie sits in Puerto Rico. The very moment. And very violent storm. You know, you, you, you know, I have friends that have lived through these. It's so difficult to explain. I've seen it over and over again. I've watched the pattern. The greater the pressure, the greater the corresponding catastrophe. But it happens. There's something about that covenant land. And, and then, so then... Trump's meetings was over. Marie moved off, and uh, that was it. So he had $250 billion plus in damages and mass dislocation. We've had almost $1 trillion in hurricanes that have a connection to the state of Israel. And then um, hurricanes Florence and Michael, two historical record-setting uh, hurricanes. 
and over 100 billion plus in damages. Uh, Florence and Michael, uh, September, October 2018, over 100 billion dollars plus in damages. We must continue to pray for those impacted by these storms. And these five hurricanes, Harvey, Irma, Marie, Florence, and Michael have had their names retired due to size and cost during Trump's first two years. They were so big. Uh, we actively, uh, I've been sending things to the White House, sending books to the White House. And then I got, uh, Michelle Bachman said, Bill, I've got a meeting at uh, the State Department. Uh, this was in February with uh, Secretary Pompeo, who was a good friend of Michelle's from their time in Congress together. Kushner was going to be there, Greenblatt was going to be there, other members of the advisory committee, uh, Pastor Jeffers, uh, uh, Pastor Jack Graham was there, and uh, numerous other people uh, were in the meeting, and Michelle uh, submitted my book, Eye to Eye to Pompeo, Kushner and Greenblatt, and Mike Pompeo said to Michelle, I hear you, I hear you, Michelle, I hear you. <laughs> Michelle's tenacious. But I met with them right afterwards at the Trump International Hotel, and they all said uh, Michelle just did a fantastic job of, of, of really speaking about the consequences and possibly the possibility of Mr. President Trump's re-election if he, if he uh, does the wrong thing. And uh, Dr. Kaiser uh, hit, hit it right on today. Our blessing right now, the reason we're still standing here in America is because of this president's support of the state of Israel. We've never had a president even close to being as supportive of the state of Israel as he has been. So... Um, we made headway, and uh, fortunately, they divided. They, the the plan has not been submitted. Uh, it's been delayed. Uh, even the, the the Bahrain conference, which was an economic conference that was held, was put us put aside uh, because uh, we think because of the influence of uh, of the lobbying effect. I mean, we care about our country. We care about those people in harm's way. We also want to make sure we're on the right side of this. Um, as as you all know, uh, Jerusalem is God's time clock. Pastor Criswell used to say at First Baptist, you want to know where things stand biblically and prophetically, watch what's happening with the city of Jerusalem, God's time clock. And, um, and it shall be in that day that I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. The only major country right now that's standing for Israel, standing for Jerusalem, is the United States. We have some smaller companies, Guatemala, um, others are considering Brazil, Australia, but uh, Brazil's concerned. There's a lot of Hillel meat that goes to the Arabs, a billion dollars, so they've been able to stop Brazil's moving of the embassy to Jerusalem, but, you know, it's all political. But nonetheless, no country like the United States when it comes to, uh, or this president. Trump was uh, with Netanyahu uh, May 23, 2017. I was there for their first meeting. Uh, it was quite a meeting. Trump's Middle East Dream Team, uh, Pence, uh, David Friedman, who spoke, spoke to Christian leaders in Washington right after he became uh, the ambassador. And a lot of the Jewish groups, uh, the Jewish groups, 20% of Jews are Orthodox, that they're very fundamental uh, in their faith, like we are with our faith, evangelicals. 80% are Reform and Conservative and, and tend to be liberal. And uh, they, they were opposing Friedman's selection. And this is a man that knows Hebrew, who gives money to the settlement community, who sat with some friends of mine in January of 2017. Uh, we were uh, in San Diego speaking at a conference, and 35 friends of mine, uh, people that I know, he sat down and went right through the Tana uh, Old Testament, the Tanakh, talking about Israel's biblical right to the land. This is Trump's ambassador to Israel. And who wants to see Israel live in peace, but he fully understands Israel's biblical right to the land. Trump's Middle East Dream Team at the time. Uh, this was uh, the Dream Team. Uh, Mattis, uh, you know, a warrior. Uh, he understood the Middle East. Uh, they had some differences, and they had some differences over Israel, but uh, eventually he moved on. Uh, Pompeo, oh, what a blessing he's been. Nikki Haley, oh, can you imagine the job that she did as UN ambassador? Remarkable. Right in the, right in the teeth of that UN that constantly fulfills or uh, passes resolution that are anti-Israel. When many members of the UN, many members of the UN, anti-Semitic, hate Israel, they're constantly voting on resolutions against Israel. When you have all these nations that have very significant problems, you hardly ever hear a resolution about, whether it's Iran and, and others. You just don't hear it. And, uh, and John Bolton, um, he tells it like it is. 
He sees things so clearly, and, and at times, it, you know, it rubbed the president wrong. But uh, uh, the president will remember John Bolton's position on some things, because he was very, he's always been succinct and very direct about what he has to say. Um, Trump committed to moving the U.S. Embassy December 6, 2017. This is interesting. This is six months to the day that we passed, we began, uh, the first ever Jerusalem prayer breakfast began on, uh, um, it was in that period of June 5 and 6 in Jerusalem. Six months to the day they moved the embassy. Uh, President Trump uh, finally signed off moving the embassy to Jerusalem. Trump withdrew Iran from the Iran nuclear deal, May 2018. A terrible deal. U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem opens May 14, 2018. Uh, Trump two-state plan. He spoke of that with Netanyahu uh, at the UN again in 2018. But he said, he says, I, I like the two-state solution, but he said it's up to Israel. Well, right now, President Trump, they are not, if a, if a plan gets delivered, you know, uh, you know, it's up to the Lord if it does get delivered, but uh, they are not going to put two-state in there. They, they will not. They, it's not going to happen. Uh, and I'll get to that just shortly here. Uh, to Trump formally recognizes Israel's control of the Golan Heights. This is huge. I remember in uh, uh, early 20, 2016, uh, Obama's last year in office, when Israel, uh, Netanyahu brought his whole cabinet up to the Golan. And they, and they at that time acknowledged that Israel has the right to the Golan Heights. They'd already annexed that this was their property. Within minutes, the EU, the UN, and then within a day, the Russia, the United States chastised Netanyahu, say, how dare you say that? You don't have the right to the Golan Heights. That's part of UN Resolution 238. You can't stand for that. That is not yours. It's serious. I mean, this is big news. Trump said, heck with that. We're going to back Israel's right to the Golan Heights. Quick note here. It was very interesting. Um, when Mike Pompeo was at, the U, uh, at, at West Point, top of his class, he studied the tank wars. He became a tank commander. One of the main wars that he studied at West Point was the Yom Kippur War and Israel's capturing of the Golan Heights with the use of tanks. And um, four years ago, uh, it was 2016, or I'm sorry, 2015, uh, where uh, I was with three leaders of Samaria, and we went up to meet with 20 congressmen and, and a couple senators. And right after we walk into uh, Mike Pompeo's office, the first thing he said to these leaders of Samaria, well, I'm so glad you didn't give up the Golan Heights. And as right at the time, Netanyahu was negotiating with Erdogan from Turkey and Assad on giving up some of the Golan. And now he's the opportunity to be Secretary of State and to stand for the Golan Heights and also uh, for the Israel's right uh, to say that those settlements are not illegal. So anyhow, that very significant move. Uh, Trump Heights, uh, now we have uh, Israel invades uh, Trump Heights settlement. There's a community up there. I mean, there's, there's going to be a community called Trump Heights. Uh, it's, it's incredible. And then, and this is another one of those things, this is like a little rock out in front of the Mamilla Hotel. For all of President George W. Bush's effort, and the 24 trips that Condoleezza Rice took to Israel in the second term of, uh, of um, President Bush, who birthed the word two states living side by side in peace and security, the 9-11 terror events stopped from being presented the first time. But this is, what, this is his acknowledgement in Israel. They like President Bush, but this is what they thank him. A little rock out in front of the Mamilla Hotel. Just so interesting. Peace to Prosperity Workshop. This is where they divided the, the economic from the land, and I think that uh, lobbying had an influence in this. Uh, and then Pompeo says Israel's settlements not illegal. This was huge. Very significant because everybody, or the major powers, the EU and others, said before that they're illegal, and after they said it's illegal. Didn't bother. President Trump and Mike Pompeo. And, they, and the State Department took a year studying this whole process. Legally, they looked at every aspect of this and they said, this is not illegal for what Israel's done here. They spent, a, it was a tedious process. It wasn't just like, okay, we're going to go say this. They, they looked into it. And uh, plus Pompeo being a Harvard Law, law graduate, I mean, he, he knows the law and they did it very smartly. 
But then the U.S. House passed uh, last Friday a resolution supporting the two states because of what Trump and Pompeo did. They said, no, no, we still favor two states. I have some friends uh, with Messianic Jewish Alliance, uh, Joel Chernoff, Paul Lieberman, and their lobbyists were working real hard on the one state plan in Congress. And I told them, um, guys, you got, you, you're going your, to have your hands full. Um, you got to focus on the Democrats. Republicans are going to go with you. You got to focus on the Democrats. And then I, you know, I popped an email. They just were amazed that, that, that uh, the, the Democrats did this. But it was because of what Trump and Pompeo did. They didn't want to give Trump any kind of victory here. Trump, and then today, another bold thing for the Jewish community and in Israel, Trump signs executive order to crack down on anti-Semitism on college campuses. This is huge because most of the Middle East departments in the college campuses around the country are funded by the Saudis. And being you, in, there are a lot of schools in the country that are, you know, Jewish people can't wear their kippahs. They don't, they feel threatened. But this is huge. This is a, a, another strong stance of this president for Jewish people. Uh, I'm going to go through a couple of slides here, and then I'll work into the uh, Russia, China, and Iran. Uh, hit on those because these are very, very important. Uh, Christian media, uh, two, couple about a month ago, we were at the Christian Media Summit. Uh, this is put on by the Israeli press office. They bring media from all over the world that are supportive of Israel in for a conference. This is, they've done it for three years. We've been there two of the last three. And uh, Benjamin Netanyahu spoke to us the first night. Uh, this is my, from my camera. I had a chance to shake his hand and his wife's right after that. Uh, very gracious people. And uh, he's got his cha challenges, no doubt, as well. And then um, David Friedman gave a great message and appreciation of the Christians that had come in. Um, from around the world and then the Golan we went to the Golan Heights for a briefing uh, this was on the, what Israel's doing with the fact now under the nose of the UN there's 120,000 rockets pointed at Israel this is under the nose of the UN peacekeepers since 2006 but they have some electronics. They, their tanks are impenetrable. They got the best in the world. Uh, they have everything set up on a grid up there. I mean, anytime anything happens up there, I mean, they're warned. God's giving them technology that's extraordinary. They were telling us about where all the, the rockets are placed in this one area. He said they're three-story homes. They got the rockets in the middle part of the houses. We're going to have to take them out. Um, they, they know what's going on. It's like what King Hussein said after the Six-Day War. He said, you know, the, the Arabs have 34 bases in the Middle East. Israel knows more about them in, day, in times of operation what's there than we do ourselves. But when you're a tiny little country like Israel that has neighbors and want to destroy them, they've got to be like that. And, uh, and then uh, this is me at the Trump. Uh, it was just quite an enjoyable day being there at the the sight of this. <laughs> and then uh, uh, President uh, Rivlin, a wonderful man, he's up there shaking a couple of friends of mine's hands uh, there at the, uh, at the President's house. And then here's Claudia doing what she loves doing the most, talking to your soldiers about Jesus. And I don't know, they, when Claudia starts talking about Jesus, they listen. It's, it's, it's something to watch. And uh, talks to you about uh, what happens when you're in harm's way. This, it all depends. Every time is different as the Holy Spirit leads. You know, who are you going to call on uh, when, when you're in harm's way? A lot of times they say Moses. And Claudia says, sorry, so let me tell you about somebody who really loves you. And she starts talking about Yeshua. So this was, uh, this was a fun time. And then um, this is... Uh, one of the managers at the Orient Hotel. I shared this today with some of the speakers at lunch. Um, the Jerusalem Prayer Breakfast, which was June of last year, uh, Anne Graham Lotz spoke um, uh, at the hotel at the Orient and also at the Knesset. And she started talking about Jesus. Well, this gentleman started tearing up. And another one of the Arabs that was also one of the managers in the hotel started tearing up over what Anne was saying. And Ann heard about this, and Ann was leaving to come back to the U.S., and Ann said, Claudia, would you follow up with these two guys? So Claudia went in and shared the gospel with Jason here and uh, Ibrahim, and they both gave their life to Jesus. And um, when we were going on this trip, 
Claudia said, Ann, I'm going to take Jesus and me, your new book. Uh, could you sign a note? She did. And, and this is Jason's appreciation of Ann and the book that she just received. And, um, and during the Christian Media Summit, which is also at the Orient, we have two other managers that have now given their life to Jesus. So the Orient Hotel in Jerusalem has four believers in Yeshua now. So praise God for that. Um, Tommy, how am I, Tom, I'm going to run through some things. Go. Okay, all right, brother. Um, the conflict in the Middle East, it's, you know, it's, it's pretty complicated. And the big thing in the Middle East is one of the greatest conflicts is the Shiites versus the Sunnis. And we've got the Shiites led by Iran, which is uh, antagonistic towards Saudi Arabia. And Saudi Arabia worries about Israel, uh, Iran becoming nuclear because they're going to be the second one hit after Israel. Well, I'll tell you what, Saudi Arabia, Iran would be as interested in taking out Saudi Arabia as they would be Israel. And they don't, the, the, the blood is bad over, over who has the lineage uh, to Muhammad. And Iran... It has proxies in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, and Yemen. These are all majority Shiite countries. And the, the challenge here is these countries are all beginning to bring weapons in, some new, some later, such as in uh, Syria, that are going to point rockets at Israel. Iraq, they're, they're bringing missiles into Iraq right now pointed at Israel. Iran's going to be bringing weapons that have been the Yemenis, Yemenis uh, the Houthis there, that have been pointing at Saudi Arabia, are going to start pointing at Israel. So Israel knows about this. They've got their eye on this. But, you know, they're talking, Iran keeps getting s smacked by Israel inside of Syria. Uh, Israel goes in and takes out their new missile shipments. Missiles are more concerned than rockets. And one of our top generals said the other day, Iran has the most advanced missiles in the Middle East and the most of them, even more than the European Union. And they, they popped a couple of missiles into the Saudi refineries. It was a miracle. It, didn't, it could have been much worse and crippled the economy uh, of the world because 25% of the daily oil goes through the Persian Gulf. Iranians are strategic and they got a plan. And then a, a journalist from uh, Saudi Arabia said to me, he says, Bill, the Sunnis play checkers, the Persians play chess. Three-dimensional chess. They're so smart, they're so patient, they've got a strategy. And then you had the Persian Gulf countries, Saudi Arabia, United Arab Emirates, Kuwait, Oman, Bahrain, and Qatar, that are, are all on the Persian Gulf. And 80% of the Muslims are Sunnis. So this is a, this is a very significant conflict. And here's the uh, Shia versus Sunni countries. Iran, uh, you know, is a significant property. And then Iraq. Well, these are two large oil producers in, 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 the, in the world. Now, I'll have more on that shortly. Trump and King Salman. They, uh, Jared Kushner was, uh, said, you know, let's, take it, let's, go into the, let's go into Saudi Arabia first. This will be the first foreign visit. And he set up a meeting where President Trump had the opportunity to speak to 55 Muslim leaders. Trump spoke to these leaders, which was, I mean, unheard of, where we have an American president who says, okay, uh, I'm coming to Riyadh, and I want to speak to you guys, and if you're friends of us and put down your terrorism weapons, you've got a great friend. If you don't, then you're an enemy of us. And he told them that. And uh, in Trump style. And then... Um, Salman and Kushner had developed a close relationship where they stay up numerous times uh, overnight uh, swapping stories and planning strategy on the, the deal of the century. Um, Iran's Khamenei attacks Trump's nuclear deal decision. He decided to get out of it. After the deal, a new Iranian strategy was presented by Mike Pompeo at the Heritage Foundation. Twelve things the Iranians need to do. And they, they, they probably won't do any more than a couple things, if that. The main thing is that for them to stop the missile, the missile development. And Iran's committed to that. 
and the Iran nuclear deal that uh, Obama and the G uh, the G5 plus one, uh, uh, Russia, China, uh, uh, Germany, France, and the UK and the United States plan gave Iran after a few years, a couple more years, to be able to be develop nuclear weapons. What kind of plan is that? Just postponement. Uh, U.S. decided to lead the Human Rights Council, a cesspool of political bias. This was a very significant move. Uh, then the Iranian leader Khamenei, strategic and patient. They're chess players, the Iranians, they're master negotiators. I have a friend at the Israeli Embassy in Washington, D.C. He, he's now in the, in the U.K. He said, Bill, you can't out-negotiate an Iranian. They're, they're masters at negotiations. They'll agree to a deal, and then a few years later negotiate the same deal with less teeth in it. They're, they're masters. They get PhDs. An Iranian guy in, D in D.C. told us they get PhDs in negotiations. They'll drive you crazy. And they have their proxies. And they're also working right now to get into Sudan and Libya. This is part of the coalition of nations in Ezekiel 38 and 39 deploy missiles in those countries. More missiles in the Middle East and even more than the EU. I mentioned that already. And U.S. sanctions have been very costly to that country. The sanctions were hurting, uh, during Obama's time, the sanctions were put in place were hurting Iran, but then right at the time of breaking, the lifeline was thrown and they cut the, the nuclear deal because Obama didn't have any legacy from all his efforts in the Middle East. And then obviously a threat to the Persian Gulf. And Iran's also doing a Red Sea play. They're really focused on this Red Sea access and um, access of the, of the Red Sea, which is also another area where we bring oil, and, uh, oil through, and then also the Persian Gulf. The uh, U.S. is pressing allies to stop Iranian purchases. They, they did in November and gave them uh, uh, a little bit more time, but now uh, it is really hurting their economy. President uh, Rouhani uh, makes veiled threats about disrupting oil by sh shutting the Strait of Hormuz. General Sol Soleimani supports actions. Soleimani, um, he's missed, just missed a couple assassination attempts. He's ahead of their al Quds force and a very dangerous guy. Um, Iran's hardliners support Rouhani's pushback against the United States. You can see the Red Sea and the Persian Gulf here. You know, those two uh, checkpoints where you see the, the blue marks. Uh, that's what they want to do. If, if Persia, I mean, Iranian, strategic, very clever. If they can shut those two, they could literally bring those access points to oil. They could literally bring the world economies to their knees. I mean, look what happened in July of 20, uh, 2008 when oil hit $147 a barrel. Crippled two of our major oil companies, co corporations were going bankrupt. And if they can stop the oil through those two, it could be catastrophic. Um, uh, Mark Langford, a friend of mine, is a Jewish attorney from uh, Manhattan. Um, he uh, is, does maps that, uh, uh, that focus. He's ahead of Americans for a Safe Israel. And uh, he calls this black gold, the Persian Gulf, Strait of Hormuz. 56% of the world's proven oil and gas is in that quadrant there. Iraq, Saudi Arabia, uh, United Arab Emirates, uh, part of Oman, Bahrain. Doesn't have much oil in Iran. So they can control this, which they, they have the missile capability now that they can, they can control this. But, um, and I think uh, one of our top generals the other day who handles the Middle East said it's, he would not be surprised if Iran doesn't uh, attack again soon. Top Iranian general uh, Hassan Salami forces in Syria awaiting orders to destroy Israel. Uh, Bolton threatens Iranian generals uh, will come after you. This was last year, in September. This was at the United States, or it's United Against Nuclear Iran Summit in New York. <clears throat> Iran and Hezbollah prepare to confront Israel in response to its actions in Syria, Lebanon, and, and Iraq. Uh, concern lately is, uh, matter of fact, this week, uh, some Russian jets kind of moved a couple of the Israeli jets off, off target. They were going into Syria to take out some uh, more uh, missile movements and Russia Su-35s kind of sh uh, shoved the, the Israeli jets back out the ocean and, uh, and found out later it was, it was cover for Iranians moving some new missiles into, uh, into Syria. So uh, I'll talk about that shortly. Um, Jeremiah 49, 35 through 39 talks about the day that the bow of Elam uh, will be busted, or will be broken. Uh, Elam is modern day Persia. Uh, modern-day Persia is Elam. 
uh, in here it highlighted, For I will cause Elon to be dismayed before their enemies. I will bring evil upon them, even my fierce anger, saith the Lord. And I will set my throne on Elam. But it shall come to pass in the latter days that I will bring against the captiv- captivity of Elam, saith the Lord. Some people believe that this will be fulfilled. Some people say it's never been fulfilled. Some people say it has. But the bottom line is there's a, the gospel is being shared throughout Iran right now. Many people are coming to Christ in Iran. Through uh, Iran Live, it's uh, headquartered here in Dallas. Uh, we have some other friends who are doing ministry work in Iran. So there's, this scripture sounds like Iran's, even before the Ezekiel 39 uh, conflict, will, will uh, have a devastated hit. So will it be Israel, the United States? Israel's got a plan. Believe me, now with the stealth, they've got a plan. If they get smacked, they're going to smack uh, Iran. And they might even have to do it first, which they almost did in 2008 when Obama was in office. So, uh, U.S. and Russia, this relationship uh, uh, is difficult uh, for many reasons, and we'll go into that, but the main concern ours is the rapid movement of Russia into the Middle East. I mean, they are really moving in quickly. They're doing, they're in Syria, that's their beachhead. They have a port in Tartus, Syria. Uh, They're selling S-400 weapons to Turkey, despite NATO, despite the United States says, don't do it. The only good thing that came from that is we're not going to send Turkey some of our F-35 stealth jets that they were buying. The interesting aspect of this, part of the stealth, the F-35, is made in Turkey. And so the, right now the Pentagon is ready to, it's uh, going to cost about $500 million to move that facility out of there, uh, but they're going to be building parts of the F-35 in other places besides Turkey. The other problem is the United States has a base there in Turkey, about 2,000 troops, but we also have uh, up to 50 nuclear weapons at that Turkish base which is also complicates things. And also, you know, when Turkey, uh, or when Trump moved uh, some people out of uh, the Kurdish area, or the, our, our, our boots in the ground, the, the Kurds there in uh, Syria, uh, he was absolutely surprised by the backlash from Christians uh, that love the Kurds. And this is a PKK part of the Kurds. This is more of the terroristic, difficult, uh, not, the, not the Peshmerga Kurds of northern Iraq. This is, uh, these are Kurds that basically were our boots in the ground that did a great job against ISIS. They are the best fighters in the Middle East. And then to throw them under the bus, but I can tell you, I know people, and you know people that flocked into the White House quickly after this. Franklin Graham and others, Pastor Jeffers, others spoke out that, you know, this, these are our Kurds. These are our friends. We've got to do something about this. So anyhow, um, uh, things have calmed down a bit, but uh, 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 that was a difficult situation. I mentioned the SU-35 deflected Israeli jets this week. Um, you know, uh, they're moving their way. Uh, they're doing, uh, just the other day, um, Russia's talking with Egypt about buying jets right now. And the United States says, stop it. Stop it. If you buy those jets, we're going to shut off. Uh, we're talking about shutting off uh, funding to you guys. So that's very tentative. Saudi Arabia, they're supposedly going to develop some nuclear facilities for Saudi Arabia. Uh, they're doing a lot of oil deals there. They're part of OPEC Plus now. Um, and they're helping build a nuclear facility in Turkey as well. And uh, they're moving into the region uh, more so than ever before. Uh, see, Ariel, Ariel Sharon pushed the importance of an Israeli relationship. He did a lot to develop a relationship with Putin. Netanyahu continued that. Omer didn't, but Netanyahu has. And unfortunately, we're sharing, uh, Israel and Russia are sharing a lot of things in technology, science, oil and gas. And that, that's, you know, we're getting a little nervous. But, you know, uh, they're trying to keep the big bear happy. And, uh, you know, eventually that, that won't work out too well for them. Uh, Russia is using their very sophisticated uh, social network people, uh, focusing on the young Sunnis, developing a favorable relationship with them about Russia, and they're doing it masterfully. And uh, so more and more of the young, the, 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 the Middle East is full of 30, 40 percent, uh, 30 and under kids. I think in Iran, I heard it's almost 50 percent in Iran are under 30. So Russia, very smart people too, are appealing to the social networks, to the Arabs, the Sunnis, and even the Shiite for a, fav- for a favorable look to them, or for them to be fav- favored. Uh, and also exploiting President Trump's desire to exit the Middle East. 
And um, we're not completely out of there. We understand the importance of being there, but President Trump has really expressed, we've already spent five, six trillion in the Middle East and, uh, and a lot of loss of life and a lot of injuries. We need to do something. Um, 700 Russian people and companies are under U.S. sanctions. Uh, what's also interesting is uh, Russia bombers continue to uh, uh, come near our shore uh, with fighter jets and have to be scrambled. Uh, also, the Russia's 300 S-300s uh, in Syria. Israel will have to think twice about the next strike. Uh, and now they have the S-400, see, more sophisticated. Israel's figured out how to beat the S-300, uh, but now they're working on trying to beat the S-400 system. Uh, they beat the 300 by doing Mediterranean exercises. So, you know, God always gives them a step ahead of the, of the enemy. Uh, top U.S. Admiral warns of Russia's submarine threat. We've had Russian subs on our coast over a few times, uh, very close to the United States. So they're, they're kind of playing with us uh, a bit. And there was a Russian sub accident recently, and uh, one of the pretty well-qualified uh, stories, uh, even beyond a rumor, was that the, the Russian sub was attempting to cut internet phone lines that come from Europe to the United States and, it, and ended up having an accident and losing some of their soldiers. So, uh, you know, Russia's nipping at us. Um, you know, also, you know, if you put yourself in, your, in, in their shoes, you, you got all your friends, Putin's friends have all been sanctioned. And his country's been sanctioned. And it's cost him. So what are they going to do? At some point, they're going to respond. So it's a, te a very difficult world that we live in on the uh, international front. And then Lavrov rejected Israel's sovereignty in the Golan in October uh, 12. He was at the White House yesterday, a meeting with Trump. And I don't know, I have all the details of that meeting yet, but, uh, uh, you know, Russia was furious by that uh, situation because he's right there in the border of, of Syria. That's very valuable land. Uh, U.S. pulls out a Reagan uh, air arms treaty saying Russia made no efforts to comply. Um, but isn't it interesting, the Gog and Magog alignment, Trump has sanctioned Russia, Iran, and Turkey strongly. Turkey, there's still some sanctions on Turkey, but the, the bulk of the strong ones have been against Russia and Iran. And this has driven these three guys closer together. Rouhani, Putin, and Erdogan. Another meeting in uh, Tehran. And then another one recently in Sache, I think this is the one in Sache, Russia. Uh, and then the Russian Navy celebrates Navy Day with a parade in Tartus, Syria. Uh, a quick one over, uh, on China. Uh, what really concerns the United States, and Israel should be concerned too, is uh, China has gained, is, has gained control of the Haifa port. They're spending a few billion dollars to construct the port. And the United States says, you've got to stop that because we're not putting our sixth fleet in there again. They've, they've done that before, come into the... He said, you better stop that. You've got to stop that arrangement. Uh, China has spent $25 billion in Israel. They're buying all kinds of companies. They bought the largest dairy producer in Israel because Israeli cows produce more milk per cow than any, any other dairy country. Uh, companies in the world, agriculture, science, medicine, technology, China's in there buying stuff up. And the United States says, uh, you better get accountable. We want, we want accountability. So Israel's now got a group that's been, uh, Netanyahu's put in place that they're going to fully investigate all business that China's doing with Israel and review it. Um, oil deals with Saudi Arabia and Iran and Iraq. Um, China is doing big deals with Saudi Arabia at one time, and they might still be the largest, largest buyer of oil from Saudi Arabia. They've done joint oil deals in Iran. They've put those on hold because of sanctions. And also, they and Russia have become major players in Iraq's oil fields, which is one of the top four in the world. We spent all that money. We've got a couple of U.S. companies in there. But we've got China and Russia that are gaining a lot of money from doing oil, oil deals inside of, inside of Iraq. Uh, and also mentioned earlier, they penetrated our U.S. power grid in stolen technology. And you know, we talk about the Bible. Uh, we, we, we say the 200 million man army one day will have a, uh, the Bible speaks of that. Some people believe that's China. Uh, a few years back, I looked at the CIA fact book and at that time, China could put a, a, an army together of 196 million people. 
if, if needed, to be, needed to be. And uh, also, uh, we've, we've been close a couple times with a military conflict with China over Taiwan and a Japanese, uh, Japanese island. Uh, and also recently, uh, Congress kind of forced Trump's hand uh, on Hong Kong. I mean, something needed to be done, but right in the middle of uh, tight negotiations, they pass on almost a unanimous resolution uh, backing Hong Kong's right to independence. It infuriated China, and China says, we're not going to allow your ships anymore to come into Hong Kong for refueling. And then, um, and then uh, China's worked its way into South America. Uh, they're a major player with Venezuela's oil. Uh, along with Russia, Panama Canal, the control a Chinese company controls that, and in Africa, they're after their their uh, rare earth minerals. And uh, you know, just finish it, finish with these. Um, Defense Secretary uh, Mattis, when he was in office, warned of Chinese intimidation in the South China Sea, and uh, that there would be reprisals, and and also. When you talk about China's moving into all these countries around the world, they also, with this recent Hurricane Dorian, um, Marsh Harbor Port in Abaco Island, which is right there in the Bahamas, uh, China was just completing a $40 million port in uh, Marsh Harbor. And the United States Coast Guard says, you're not, you're not meeting the qualifications. So we're not going to allow any of our ships to come in there. But our great concern was that this fentanyl that's working its way into the United States, that's destroying a lot of our young people, is, would possibly be coming. This would be one of the locations that would come in besides Mexico. And literally, this port was within a very short period of time of being completed. And Dorian was in a unique earth, uh, hurricane because it literally came in and sat on the Bahamas. Usually it keeps moving on, but it's sad. It literally, I said, there's something really strange about this. Uh, Trump was real involved with Greenblatt at the time of the hurricane. But, and I'll give more details just briefly. Uh, but this literally sat on Abaco Island and wiped this port out completely. And then it moved, then it also destroyed the Grand Bahama Airport, which was owned by Chinese Hutchison Port Holdings out of Hong Kong. And then Freeport Harbor is also owned by the Chinese. So this was one of those, and also there's, uh, Grand Bahamas is a very significant gambling place. It's uh, 15, 20 casinos, many of those were wiped. So um, quick note here, just to complete it, Dorian started heading right after doing sitting on the Bahamas, was heading right towards Mar-a-Lago, Trump's, uh, Trump's home. And Greenblatt and Trump were talking about a peace deal, possibly even delivering it right before the Israeli election uh, to help Netanyahu. Netanyahu said it possibly is going to happen for the second election, September 17th. And uh, at the last minute, uh, Greenblatt says, no, we're not going to deliver it. For whatever reason, he just said, we're not going to deliver it before the election. We're going to wait till the, the government gets seated. Doreen started working its way up, up north, went up the coast. What was also interesting, it came out, uh, Governor DeSantis from Florida had put a note in the Western Wall in Israel asking God to spare the state from storms in May of this year. And it come to find out, I did some more homework and found out that Governor Christ had done the same thing uh, in, beginning in 2007. He, he'd done the same thing after Florida was hit so hard in 2004 and 2005 by hurricanes. 2006, when Trump said, I'm not going to pressure Israel to, to give up their land, nothing happened in six. But he put something in the wall in seven to spare the state, and every year up until the time he left office and even went into Congress, a note was put in the wall every single year. And the last one he put in the wall was in uh, 2016 when he was a congressman in Jerusalem, spare our state. And, uh, and then uh, DeSantis uh, picked up on this in May. Uh, 2017, Hurricane Michael hit, hit, uh, hit Florida hard. Best we know, there wasn't any covering. I, I don't know. It's just really interesting. You have all those years, no, no hurricane. He, 
of any significance hit Florida, except for 17 when Michael came ashore, Irma skip, skipped up the coast. And then, so we've contacted a friend of mine who's a friend of the governors of South Carolina. I know it's gone on the wall for South Carolina. Uh, another friend that was with Lieutenant Governor of North Carolina just recently, he put a note in the wall for North Carolina. And also, I put a, wall in the, uh, in a note in the wall for Texas a month ago. So we'll see what happens. But anyhow, that, I thought that was an interesting note. So uh, anyhow, I'd be more than happy to take some questions. I covered a lot of territory tonight, but uh, obviously there's a lot going on. So uh, please, whatever, the Washington thing, so whatever I can answer. What's that? Well, uh, about the impeachment? Um. Yeah, we'll, we're going to have question and answers. We're going to take a, are you finished? Yeah. Uh, okay, we're going to take a 10-minute break. We can start with Charlie. Okay. Mic on? Yeah. Uh, in one of the uh, last few months issues of Imprimis by Hillsdale College, uh, there was an article by a fellow who worked with Ron Reagan on finding out how on earth with the Soviet Union financing itself, knowing that Reagan knew intuitively that no communist society can be productive unless it parasitically lives off capital and cash. And so he investigated it and found all kinds of ways the Russians were financing themselves through us, through investing, bond issues, and, and so forth. Well, then what he said in this article on Imprimis, he said, we need to do the same thing with China. China has to get cash from outside of itself. And it's getting it through, he says, a company's building their missiles financed by bond money through US investment ETFs and so on. So what are we doing about that? Or what can we do? Well, that, that is a great question. Um, Kevin Freeman, who lives in this area? If you put Kevin Freeman of uh, China, Kev is he's a uh, a friend. Uh, he is a master at this. He he advises the Pentagon and other organizations in Washington. Uh, Kevin Freeman, um, you might put China Risk, and his website is there. And contact Kevin. Um, but this is the problem. Our Wall Street guys, you know, are greedy. And wherever they have an opportunity to make a buck, they're going to do it. And that was a problem with a lot of our companies. They were so quick to move into China. Fine, we'll give you our technology. We just want your market. Well, that was foolish. It was greed-based. And unfortunately, China received a tremendous amount of uh, uh, technology um, uh, through the process. Uh, as, as far you know, it was interesting. Reagan had the attitude that we got to break. We got to break the Soviet Union. We're going we're gonna to ratchet up our defense. We're going to spend so much money that Russia is going to try to stay up and it's going to break them. Um, and, and then uh, George Herbert Walker Bush started going in and out of Russia with some Wall Street guys. I think it was Goldman Sachs and some others that, you know, thought that there was a great opportunity. Then the ruble crashed. That was in, I think, 98, 99, uh, if I have the years correct. But that, what... China, you know, when you think about how much China produces for the United States, I mean, it is in so many areas, clothing, I mean, labels on almost all our clothes, I mean, products, and we're so worried about uh, the effect that that would have on a lot of our corporations if we put too much, you know, it's put too much pressure on China, uh, it's, you know, the whole tariff thing could get out of control, um, uh, they're trying to do business uh, with China at the same time, not creating a situation that could be really dramatic to the U.S. stock market. I mean, look, every time they think they're going to uh, got a deal cut, look what it does to the stock market. And then they say, no, no, it doesn't look like we're close. Then it drops again. And uh, in this whole process, Charles, is uh, it's a very convoluted relationship uh, matter of fact, I even thought of, in 2015, I'm going to look at what China's GDP was at the time of 2000, at the time of the 9-11 terror events. Um, in 2001, at the time of the 9-11 terror events, China's gross domestic product was $1 trillion. 
Ours was like, I think, uh, 10 or 11 trillion at the time. So what we did is we over, the United States overstimulated our economy in order to take, you know, because the, ba the backlash of 9-11 was devastating to our economy. So the, the, the Wall Street got into subprime lending, got into a lot of risky lending. They started doing a lot of business with China. And now China's GDP is right up there almost near, near ours at 14, 15 trillion in, in 18 years. Look how much their economy gone from 1 trillion to 13, 14 trillion uh, compared to where we were and where we are now. China has benefited so much by our overstimulation of our economy to offset the cost of 9-11. And in that process, they are in technology, they're in science, they're in computers, they bought the IBM think tanks, they're developing their own computers. This Huawei organization is a very significant threat. And you know, it's how do you do less damage to the United States at the same time while trying to punish China? And it's real risky. But Kevin Freeman really understands it. And, you know, he's very concerned that we could have another uh, 2008, 2000, 2008, where a massive amount of Chinese money and maybe possibly uh, oil money is pulled out of the United States, causing another market collapse. Which would, which would be very costly. So I kind of answered around your question, but nonetheless, the relationship we have with China is very complicated. And when, when you put something off as long as we have with China or North Korea or anything else, the solutions are very complicated and difficult to implement. Okay, we're going to rotate back, flip back and forth. Bob? Bill, you didn't comment on the immigration or the building of the wall underneath Trump so far. And what do we expect for this next year underneath Trump as far as... Um, what immigration policies may change and, and what we're going to look at on more of the wall being built. Well, the, the problem with, the, first of all, the Democrats don't want a wall. They're going to do everything to stop the wall. Uh, they have been able to receive some money, I think, from the Pentagon to help build part of the wall. And then you get the media down there showing guys climbing over the wall, the little bit that's been built. And then you're going to hear it's going to be, they're going to, they might build up to 26, billion, uh, 26 uh, miles of wall. And then at the, the only part of the wall that's been built right now is, is a reconstruction or a redevelopment of the wall that's already been built. So in, in, in essence, I mean, part of the wall is just, I mean, it's inadequate. Um, uh, they've used some Israeli uh, technology, which helps. I mean, it's a long border, as you, as you know, here, Texas, and, and uh, my, my dad's farm in Arizona is very close to the uh, Mexican border, uh, which is also a, lar a large border. Uh, New Mexico is a large border. California, it's such, it's very difficult. Uh, another problem is uh, any, any meaningful immigration policies are stopped by these liberal judges that the Democrats have, have put into place. It happens over and over again. Uh, sanctuary cities. I mean, look at I mean, look at California. I mean, my gosh. Uh, but of course, most of these congressmen. If you started putting the immigrants, the illegal immigrants, in their neighborhoods, their attitude would change. And you feel at the same time for these these poor. A lot of these people just want a, an opportunity to work, and many of them are hard workers. And we got thugs coming in, unfortunately, also through the drug cartels. But there's a lot of people that uh, have been taken advantage of by the coyotes that make a lot of money bringing them to the border uh, up until uh, maybe, I don't know, five, ten years ago. California companies, other companies were benefiting from this cheap labor. So companies were making lots of money off this labor. So the whole thing, I, I, once again, anything Washington does, it has unintended consequences. And, and the whole process is complicated. And, you, and it's, hard to get a, it's hard to get things worked out. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to solve. This is another one of those things where the can was kicked down the road and we're at a point of a lot of complexity now. And Trump, every time they try to do something with illegal immigration, these, these liberal judges appointed by Clinton or Obama, stop it. So what's going to happen with the wall? I, I don't know. 26 miles, I think that's what they were hoping for or what I saw the other day in the article. I didn't read it, but it's a complicated mess. Uh, hopefully they can do something. Uh, well, I have heard that seven straight months uh, Im uh, illegal immigration in seven straight months. Yeah, I think that's uh, that's probably accurate. Yeah. And it's had Mexico's some... Mexico's helping a bit because Trump yeah. uh, threatened to right. start uh, doing some things with tariffs and otherwise, and Mexico started stepping up and helping. Uh, but... Uh, uh, some of these cartels, uh, you know, a couple weeks ago, I mean, these, what they, with that Mormon couple and that slaughter, um, 
Um, you know, President Trump was thinking about classifying these cartels as terrorist organizations, and Mexico kind of was offensed by that, so they haven't yet. But uh, it, once again, it's another one of those complicated situations. It's because uh, the drugs that come in from uh, Mexico, the fentanyl, the opiates, it, it's, it's tragic. And, and Trump's seen it firsthand when he goes to these small communities around the country that have been decimated uh, by drugs that have come in from Mexico. Not just Mexico, but one of the countries. Okay. Earlier when you were listing the Muslim countries that you have described as in a coalition against Israel, you included Syria in that group, especially among other theocratic Muslim countries, namely Iran, which I don't believe is an entirely apt comparison. Syria is exceptionally secular when compared to these countries, if not outright friendly towards believers. You can put up a Christmas tree in Syria. You can't do that in Iran. You can put up a cross in Syria. You cannot do that in Iran. And that is because of Bashar al-Assad, who is a more secular leader when compared to these other Muslims. That's right. When you look at his, his personal faith um, as an Alawite, which is a very unusual branch of Islam, where kind they of a quasi Shia. They they yeah. almost seem to have either inherited or somehow adopted even certain Christian customs. They have a vague belief in the Trinity. They even practice communion. They're very secretive about it, however. The times when I was most upset with President Trump was when he bombed Syria in April towards the tail end of his first hundred days in office and then when he did it as well a year afterwards because I don't think this is a country that we need to be antagonizing on the same level as Iran which is time and again proven itself to be an active let me threat. let me hit on this uh, a couple things uh, first of all you're right uh, it was interesting I have a friend uh, he's the head uh, Washington correspondent for Al Arabiya and I said to a pair right after uh, the whole situation started in Syria. Uh, you know, how long, how, long, how long will Assad be able to stay in office? A couple of weeks, a couple of months, like uh, Mubarak? Uh, he said, they're not going to get rid of him. I said, Pierre, you've got to be kidding me. I mean, look what's happened to Mubarak. Look what's happened in these other countries. He said, he's got, because of the Alawites, uh, which is about 10% of the country, uh, they control the military, the police, uh, they're very influential. Uh, he said because of the apparatus that he has in place in the Syrian army, which also is very close to Iran, he's, he, I, he said, I don't see him overthrown. I mean, here we are, what, nine, ten years later, and, he, and he's still in power. I've talked to Christian Syrians that have had to leave. And it was kind of like what happened in, in Iraq. Uh, the Christians had more freedoms under Saddam Hussein than they do now. Uh, same thing in Syria. The Christians had more freedom under Assad than they do now. Uh, the other thing, and I've uh, heard that uh, part of the, the war in Syria, the civil war, started because Turkey started reducing the amount of water that they were giving Syria that started playing into a, a lot of dissatisfaction in the country. And uh, unfortunately, unfortunate, uh, Russia and China kept stopping every meaningful UN resolutions at the UN to, uh, from the France, the UK, and the United States, permanent members of the UN Resolution Council, the five. And so nothing ever got done. And we've had, what, 500,000 to 700,000 people that have been killed. You have a dislocation of millions, five, six, seven million people. Um, and now um, um, uh, Erdogan and Turkey is using that as a weapon, t telling uh, the EU, I want you to do what I tell you to do. Otherwise, I'm going to let a million or two million or three million immigrants into your country. So it's, it's so complicated. The, the, the thing with the uh, Patriot missiles that were fired into Syria, uh, that was about the chemical weapons. Um, and that was, you know, Obama gave a red line, never, he never did anything. And so Trump was basically saying, don't do the chemicals. Um, and if you do, then we're going we're gonna to do something about it. Um, so that's, you know, it's a... General Petraeus said that Syria is the most complicated military front in the world. And he would know. It's so complicated, uh, compl uh, complicated because the, uh, the tribal factions, the Kurds, the uh, Turks, the Syrians, the Russians, the Iranians, and the U.S. are all in there. Uh, so it's, you know, it's one of those things. We're waiting for Damascus 17-1, the day that Dam Damascus will no longer exist as a city. 
And we're continuing to move it that way because Iran keeps popping weapons into Damascus. So the whole, the whole situation is very prophetic and biblical. Uh, you know, sound like you have a good understanding of what's going on there. And I, I feel for the Syrian Christians that have had to literally bail out of the country uh, because of that civil war there. I suppose what my question was to wrap it up quickly is, how do you rationalize or justify President Trump's behavior when it's one of the only things that he's really done a 180 on during his campaign where he was extremely anti-interventionist on the Syria question and now he has bombed them twice. I know that you mentioned the gas attacks, but I also recall, I believe it was Mattis who later said that they could not prove that that second one was even um, a factory that was well, under I, I would put it the this Syrian way. He, he, um, I, I could see your concern. Um, President Trump gets a intelligence report every single day from the CIA. Uh, they 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 uh, risk assess the greatest threats to the United States. Uh, obviously, there's a lot, you know, and uh, when Assad was all but defeated in 2015, summer of uh, 2015, Russia showed up. And when Russia showed up, Assad t turned the corner and he's still in power because of Russia. So um, it's it's a complicated situation. Uh, with prophetic players aligning uh, that will eventually align and become the coalition of Ezekiel 38 and 39 countries. So there's some things that we, don't, we aren't privy of that President Trump is seeing and doing. Uh, we weren't real happy when he says we're out of Syria uh, quickly. And the PKK, I was just, we we're, we're not happy about it. But it's a very complicated place. A president has to make some very difficult decisions and based on what General Petraeus said, that's one of the most difficult places in the world to contend with. ISIS was another concern. I mean, they were controlling a large part of Syria at that time, too. So I don't have the answer. I don't know why he did what he did, uh, but I, I can tell you he knows a lot more about what's going on in Syria than we do because he gets daily briefings on that stuff. Has Trump been the least uh, militant president that we've had in decades? Well, I would say so. I mean, Yeah, I know. Uh, he, he's, um, what he does is he does sanctions. He doesn't, right. you know... Uh, the, the couple times this gentleman was talking about, the couple times he put uh, cruise missiles into into Iraq. I mean, excuse me, Syria was for a purpose. Yeah. Uh, but I agree. I mean, he. But I tell you what, um, my uh, friend with Al Arabiya said, you know, Bill, I never thought thought I'd see a day where the, the Arab leaders would love Trump, but they love him. Uh, they're a little concerned now because of what he did with the Kurds, but they they really like Trump because he's tough. And he says they, they operate in a business world, and, but they, they really appreciate it. He said, I never thought I would see it where they would like Trump as much as they do, mm -hmm. most of the Middle East leaders. They're a little concerned right now about his commitment to the Middle East. But uh, this is probably 18 months ago when he told me that. So where do you see the uh, election in Israel uh, see that playing out? And also about, Lord, this, <laughs> about this new uh, non-aggression uh, pact that uh, they're trying to make with... Uh, neighboring countries um, you know they is they, you know isn't it amazing look at the political chaos as I mentioned between the in the United States and in the UK and Israel we don't know you don't know who the new government's going to be in in uh, in the UK or if you can get anything accomplished question if I had a third one. <laughs> well, what's interesting about the UK, that has to do with the Brexit as much as anything, the exit from the EU. Um, Israel, I'll try to summarize it in a, in a paragraph. Um, the last two elections, Netanyahu's picked up around, I think, 34, 35. The Blue and White Party around 32, 33. Uh, the right-wing coalition comes to about 55. The blue and white can't come up with a 61. They need that to have a majority in the Knesset. But Lieberman, unfortunately he's the kingmaker as they call him, refuses to be in a political party that includes the Orthodox Jews. And Netanyahu says, that's my right wing. I'm not going to leave him. And Lieberman has a problem with the, with the Orthodox Jews' control uh, over, over the fact they don't want to be in the military, over marriage. Uh, the Blue and White Party is very secular. Um, you know, 
the gospel uh, people, Christians, have a lot better time when the Orthodox Jews are not in charge of uh, uh, a couple departments inside Israel. They, you know, uh, a friend of mine, uh, Jewish evangelist, said that Omer, when Omer and Livni were there, we had a lot more flexibility in Israel. And, um, you know, when the Shaz took over uh, the religious department, it got really tough for some of the Christian organizations. They even had to send some people home within a week or two-week notice. So the bottom line, it's um, um, Netanyahu's right-wing Orthodox party has not been too favorable. Uh, Netanyahu is very favorable to Christians. But with that said, I mean, you know, we could have a third election. Uh, they thought there would be some people that were disgruntled by the first election, but they pretty much came out the same way in the second election. The question is, will the third election produce the same results? And if it does, it could go to a fourth election. Because the Lieberman's eight or nine members of his coalition refused to be part of the coalition. They've tried everything. And then Netanyahu being under indictment complicates things. So anyhow, only God, the God of Israel knows who, but I, I, I couldn't even venture to guess. Okay, thanks. Two, thing, two things. Uh, first of all, I wanted to thank you for your service to the country and also to the Christian community and being a watchman on the wall. Thank you very much. My question, um, the Trump administration has used sanctions as a kind of a major strategy. Uh, I guess the question I have is, uh, is this something new that others haven't done or is he just doing it more? Kind of how does it work? What's the downside and is there a diminishing return to sanctions? Boy, that's a good question. I guess it depends on where the, what the sanctions are. Um, you know, when you sanction Russia, you know, you're concerned about some type of uh, serious conflict with them, um, that one day they'll respond and do something, you know, maybe militarily. Or I know their cyber attack people have been trying to cyber attack us, Chinese, North Koreans, Iranians, or they're probably the, the top four. Uh, they're constantly attempting to cyber attack Pentagon, White House. Uh, that's a problem with the sanctions. Uh, we've never had a government that has been so sanction-oriented as this one. In a lot of ways, I'm kind of surprised he hadn't been challenged more. But you know what's interesting? The Republican Party sees his popularity, and they're concerned really to oppose anything Trump does. Um, you know, Trump will sanction anything and anybody <laughs> at any time. We've never seen anybody do it quite like him. To a certain extent, it's been effective. With Iran, it's been effective. I mean, you got banks and... Uh, companies that do not want to do any business with Iran, even to the point that China says, I, we don't want to do anything right now because we don't want to be sanctioned, we don't want to affect our banks, our, our companies. Uh, they've taken the Iran sanctions real serious, and it's been very effective through close uh, cooperation with the U.S. Treasury Department. I mean, they are really watching this. Uh, the, uh, the sanctions on, the sanction threats with the EU has brought them to the table to talk about some of the imbalances uh, you know, Trump sees how much money we spend to defend Europe through our German base or our uh, Asia through our South Korean facilities and Guam and others. So uh, he says, you know, this needs to be a more a level playing field, just like when he took on NATO. Uh, that, that was pretty powerful. And despite his style of doing things, I mean, the head of NATO, the secretary general, is very appreciative of Trump because they have, the countries are becoming stronger. They're still weak. But they're becoming stronger. So uh, I guess the bottom line, uh, I guess it depends on where the sanctions are. Iran, they've been effective. China, they brought them to the table. The people here in America have, have had to pay the price, especially the Midwestern farmers and some other companies have been affected. But the farmers are very loyal. They say, you know, we'll hang in there as long as we can. And, uh, you know, hopefully in one day this will improve. I guess USMCA is finally going to get approved, which will help farmers in Mexico and Canada. Um, so, uh, I, I don't know, we've never seen anything quite like this sanction movement, but um, we'll still see. Uh, the school's still not out. I just say right now the Iranian sanctions have been the most effective. Yes, sir. Hi, my name is Rob Cooper. I'm a, a professor with Liberty University School of Government. And I've got uh, two questions, if you can. The first question has to do with the fact you've talked about Pence, Pompeo, Bolton, and uh, some of our servant leaders uh, up in D.C. Uh, President Trump can appoint, or should appoint, about 5,000 
different political appointees throughout the federal government. I can understand why there's an emphasis on the judgments uh, on the judges because of the lifetime appointments. Uh, but has there been any movement getting some of the evangelicals and others that have a, a biblical frame of reference into positions in the government to change the culture or to, to drain that swamp? Uh, well, that's a good question. Uh, I would say, uh, first of all, it was so. It is so hard uh, to get um, um, certain people through the Senate. I mean, if they if. It's quite an effort. I mean, it's been masterful. Uh, McConnell and uh, Chuck Grassley did a great job of getting a lot of judges through. And now Lindsey Graham is doing a good job. And McConnell, they're getting them through. But they do everything they can to, uh, to slow things down, uh, put things off the calendar. Um, you know, um, fortunately, Republicans are in, in a majority in the Senate. But I mean, if it wasn't for that, I mean, we, we'd have a lot that wouldn't be in place. The other other issue which some of us kind of wonder sometimes is the turnover. President Trump has had a lot of turnover. A lot more than other administrations. Part of it's because of difficulty of working for him. Part of it is, um, you know, they just are tired of the pressure and stress and tension of being constantly uh, surveilled by the, uh, by the U.S. press. So that's, that's a challenge. Um, and uh, he also is going to try to downsize the government, so he thought this might be a good opportunity to downsize. Uh, not, you know, some people say, I, we just wish you to push more people through in other cabinets or, or other divisions of our go government, whether it's in commerce and in all these different uh, parts of our government, that they, they would push more people through. Um, it just, there's a lot of obstructionists in Congress. So wherever, wherever they are and whenever they can, they do everything they can to, if they can't completely stop it, slow down the process, uh, which leads to inefficiencies, uh, the, the danger there leaves former Obama appointees in place that become the whistleblowers that thought they heard something or overheard something, and, it, and uh, they're also the leakers. So uh, it's, it's just been a complicated two and a half, three years. And uh, the, the greatest uh, concern of the media now is four more years of Trump. <laughs> but the funny thing about it is they've made a lot of money because a lot of these organiza news organizations, these anti-Trump news organizations, are making a lot of money because of Trump. They wouldn't have been otherwise. All right, and this kind of leads into my uh, second question. Um, from what I can remember, when when Reagan was president, the media and the Democrats, uh, you know, they were against him, but um, they were against uh, George Bush. But since Trump took office, I mean, it's 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 off the chart. Whole different level. Yep. And so, with media, with academia, with the Democratic Party. That's a lot of forces. That's, that requires a lot of organization for such a concentrated effort. And I'm curious, who's driving the train? Well, you, um, they did, they did, you know, friends of mine that were there at the White House during Reagan's time, they said, you know, they were always at him. And then George Herbert Walker Bush, same thing, at him. Um, George W., I saw it firsthand. They, every day it was about Iraq and the mistake of going in there, and that's debatable at this point, but it's hindsight. But nonetheless, they were after him, anything they could to disqualify him. And, um, you know, Trump, they hate him. They've taken it to a whole different level. See, part of it, too, is they're protecting their turf. Illegal immigration, global warming. You hear, we've got 12 years to put everything in order. LGBT, same-sex marriage. Don't ask, don't tell. Is he going to get rid of this? Uh, abortion. I mean, this guy's pro-life. You know, so the, these sin things that unfortunately become the platform of the Democratic Party, they feel threatened by a conservative. And they feel threatened by someone that might take some of that turf away that they've worked hard for. And, um, and then unfortunately, I mean, I see it. We have no chance against this media. 90 to 94 five percent of the media is totally liberal and they anytime you have 91 to 95 percent of the news about the president that's negative um, y you know we, we don't have a chance and what happened is our side is turning it off because we're getting fed up with it their side is becoming more toxic 
and they continue to observe and watch and form their own opinions. I mean, there's people that we can't, you can't even talk to now that, are, that think Trump's the worst thing that ever lived. I mean, he's got his issues. There's no doubt about that. But nonetheless, he is, God put him in there, and he's doing some great things for Israel. He's doing some great things for our country that we hardly ever read about, unless you have a conservative news source that provides that. Okay, so, But you don't see um, any kind of a singular organization, singular source, or, or, or leadership exerting more influence on, on this anti-Trump. And let me just get it for the record. I'm not anti-Democrat, but I would be an anti-Democratic party. You mean anybody that's a Republic, a conservative force that could... That no, no, no. So I was talking... Uh, so the, the, you know, the first question had to be changing the culture in D.C. Oh, my. That culture is so gone. I mean, you can't believe it until you move there. Well, I, or well, be there. I, I spent um, I spent 11 years with the Department of Defense Inspector General. Uh, oh, okay. Well, yeah, good idea. Partnership, yeah. Pe pe defense and Pentagon's better, though. Thank. You. That's one of the few areas of our government that, that the public still appreciates. Yeah. It probably has the greatest approval rating. Right. Um, so I appreciated my, I appreciated my time there. I did uh, you know I did get to see a lot, uh, but here and there, I mean there you know there are pockets, and I was just curious if any of those have been able to take advantage of. That was really the first question. The second question had to do with the uh, the anti-Trump bias uh, between the media, between academia, between um, the, the Democratic Party. Let me just. The other side is so entrenched. I mean, they're entrenched and they're more motivated to continue their agenda than we are. Okay. You know, when you look at the behavior, uh, I mean, there are a lot of us that were very disappointed that Obama became president, but we were civil and we didn't act like this. You can't have a conservative voice speak on a co many college campuses in America without having either one being having their life threatened that or having to cancel at the last minute because the school says we just can't risk risk having you speak on our campus you know the tea party movement kind of was a movement it was done with a lot of believers but it also is very effective but it wasn't disorderly we have the the, the other side is disorder uh, there's some things that Trump does that just exactly what stirs him up more, and he kind of does that on purpose sometimes, but other times he doesn't. But nonetheless, they get really stirred up. And they are, I just think they're, first of all, they aren't as civil as the conservatives. And secondly, they're entrenched, and they, this is uh, uh, their protection of their turf that they've committed many, many, many years in protecting. And some of our Christian activists over the last 10, 20 years, the Family Research Council, Jim Dobson, American Family Radio, uh, uh, the late uh, uh, gentleman here in Dallas, um, um, think of him in a second, Kirby, Kirby Anderson's show, uh, he, um, yeah, I'll think of it. But anyhow. Uh, Used to be with Maddox. Yeah, Marlon Maddox. Yeah, Marlon Maddox. Okay, Marlon was one of the first guys that was really uh, on the front line. And we did a good job. And we fought them toe to toe. But unfortunately, there's more of them than us. And they control the media. And then they started calling us bigots and hate speech. You know, and then Obama came in with his civil rights agenda. He says our purpose is to have civil rights above religious rights. And the Civil Rights Commission was filled with his people. And uh, the day that Obama's getting sworn in at the White House, his LBG agenda is put on the White House website. It was hideous. They had to water it down, it was so bad. So. They're, they're just much more motivated than we are. And unfortunately, uh, they're so entrenched. I, I don't see how, uh, unless we go through a major shaking in this country, I don't see how it will ever, ever change. And unfortunately, it seems to be getting worse. R Rush. Rush. Rush Limbaugh? Yeah. He's the other side. Well, Rush to help. Here's what's interesting about the, the, the conservative talk show guys. The Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, Laura Ingram. Um, the conser talk radio, conservative talk radio does well because they have the opportunity to explain a position. The Democrats love TV because they're sound bites. So they can come in there and appeal to your emotions and make the conservatives look like bad guys because of their policies that they don't know much about, but they appeal to the emotion. Or conservative, uh, for the most part, liberal talk radio fails. They're, they're, they're failed because they, they can't defend their position. 
So that's part of our another media challenge that we're facing. Yeah, I, I was hoping you could maybe uh, shed some light or give your perspective on an issue I think is uh, uh, extremely important and we don't seem to hear a lot about it, the uh, possibility or the future of oil being denominated in dollars or some other currency, how that relates to Saudi Arabia and the United States. Well, that's been a benefit that we've had for a long time, that uh, oil's traded in dollars. And I know the Russians uh, are, and Iranians and Chinese are talking about uh, moving it off the dollar onto other currencies. And that's a concern. Uh, that's been a lot of leverage that we've had. Uh, with some of the sanctions, there's a possibility that uh, Russia might uh, uh, work directly with Iran, but there's talk of taking them out of the SWIFT program, the money transfer program. And if they get pulled out of SWIFT, they said, you know, that's, that's terrorism. So there, that money still has to be transferred. I, I'm, not, and I'm not savvy in that area, but I read something this week that Russia's threatening us if somehow or another we sanction them where they can't use SWIFT to tra transfer money. Uh, but I, but the, Russia's talking to Iran right now, and I think even India and Iran, are talk, the BRICS group, uh, Brazil included, but especially India talking about eventually transacting money and in, in their currencies with uh, some of the oil producers. I think that could be problematic for the United States. Yes? Don't you, don't you think that Trump's presidency, even if it's two terms, uh, is obviously going to cause such whiplash by the other side. Well, you know, Tommy, at some point they're going to do something. They haven't yeah. really struck us yet. And obviously our concern always is uh, militarily. No, uh, I'm talking about in, in the United States, the, polit the left whiplash, if they ever get control again before the rapture. Oh, oh my. It's, you, you, you don't, we don't want to see. Right. You know, I'm worried right now in Virginia where all of a sudden we've got a blue state where our legislature is all blue. I mean, they're all liberals and our governor is. I'm real concerned about what they're going to push through the, a, a former red state that's gradually got to the point of being a blue state. I mean, both House and Senate in Virginia now are... Uh or liberal, and we got a liberal governor. I just, you know, and if that happens to our U.S. government, oh my. Ralph Northern. What's that? Ralph Northern. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah, okay. <laughs> Hello, Bill. It's always good to see you. We appreciate you. your presentations. I've got a comment, and then I've got a question for you. <laughs> my pastor is Robert Jeffress. One of the first things he did when he came 11 years ago was start what he calls pastor's prayer partners. Right now we have over 350 men whose purpose is to pray as closely as we can 24 hours a day for him, for the president. It, um, we often meet with him before the first service. And last Sunday, he said uh, last Friday, my wife and I were at the White House for a Christmas party. And he said we were waiting the president. The president came in the room, pointed to me and said, there's my pastor. And then he said, pastor, I got a question for you. Nancy Pelosi says she prays for me every day. <laughs> now, I don't believe that. What do you say? <laughs> yes, so we're asking, what do you say? What do you say? And he said, well, at the end of the meal, when we were getting ready to go, Secret Service man came and said, the President wants you and your wife Amy to come to the Oval Office. So he comes in the Oval Office, there's the President sitting at his desk, there's Mike Pompeo, and then there's, uh, oh gosh, what's it? Mike Pence or? Um, no, Newt, Newt Gingrich. And there were a couple of people on the couch, and he said, get up so they can sit. <laughs> and so uh, the pastor said, uh, Mr. President, you asked me earlier what I thought about Nancy Pelosi. He said, I, I can't say anything about that, but I can guarantee you one thing, and that's that we have millions of Christians praying for you every day. And then sometime in the evening, it was mentioned, asked, uh, the president was asked about impeachment. And he said, I, I, I don't care about that, but it's really hard on my family. Yeah. Now my question is, when I first heard about the president pulling us out of Syria, northern Syria, 
I commented to my wife, what are they covering? Not long after, we got that wonderful, renowned religious scholar, al-Baghdadi. Were they covering this? Maybe give him a sense, a false sense of security. Do you, you have any sense that that was... What, what about Baghdadi? That there were... That the, pull, the announcement of the pullout of our forces in northern Syria, that was used to cover our actions to get Baghdadi? Oh, I think the timing was interesting. Uh, I don't know if there's any parallel. What was interesting is the, um, the, the, the week that Barack Obama's birth certificate became like big news, even some of the major networks were starting to pick up on it, because what was being done about the fact that that birth certificate was fake, uh, false, uh, the major networks, CBS and a few others, were starting to go in that direction. And what happened? 48 hours later, bin Laden was captured. And, and it just took all that birth certificate stuff completely out of the news and never heard about it again. Um, I, I think, uh, was that God's supernatural way of uh, catching Baghdadi at that time? Uh, where it was the right time? Or was it uh, something to kind of diffuse some of the... Uh, uh, over Bag And Baghdadi's number two guy got knocked out just shortly thereafter. So uh, was that God's timing or uh, was there a, a, a plan? to help defuse it. Uh, I do know uh, a lot of people uh, went to the White House right after the, this, uh, this decision to move out of Syria uh, happened. Uh, a lot of people, Franklin Graham spoke, uh, he spoke, I don't know if he's at the White House, other people were at the White House saying, we can't do to these, you can't do this to these people. And President Trump was surprised by the backlash, more than he thought about it. It also came out that, uh, you know, why are you doing anything to, to give Erdogan credit as being a great leader? He's a thug. And he you know, obviously he hears this stuff from the CIA briefings he get every day. And then it came out that Trump has two high-rise condominiums in Istanbul that he owns or partnered in. I go, oh, that's interesting. That always has to be something to everything. But nonetheless, that was a surpri surprise. We still have troops there. Uh, we pretty, pretty much to told everybody, back off. Uh, Vice President Pence was uh, in uh, Erbil uh, the other day with the Kurd leaders, uh, the Pushmerga Push side. Uh, we're doing what we can to provide money for them. I, I, I read yesterday where some of the oil that we've got control of in Northeast Syria is going to help the Kurds. So we're doing what we can to kind of backtrack and help them out. But we could not have done what we did with ISIS, the United States slash a few people with NATO, if without those uh, Kurds, those PKK Kurds. We couldn't have done it. They're, they're incredible fighters. So, um, you know, again, this is a tough region. It's always complicated, and it's never easy, uh, your decisions, and there's always consequences. Bill, could you please comment on the uh, Democratic primary, uh, presidential primary? Wow. You know, there's really a, a, a weak bench. Uh, I mentioned earlier, it's a weak bench. Um, uh, you know, Biden, you know, when he decided to run for president, I said, you know, his mouth will take him out. <laughs> you know, and, and you know, he'll never be the guy. Yeah. Uh, I just can't see it. And now all this stuff that's come out about Ukraine and his favor with his son, Hunter, and all these other things, all this other favor that the family's benefited from his time in office. Yes. It's going to surface. I mean, if, if, this, if they impeach Trump and it gets to the Senate, Hunter Biden's going to be one of the first guys called in there to, to testify. And Joe Biden will probably be also asked. Oh, it's going to get, you know, these guys are not dummies. Ted Cruz, all these guys, Lindsey Graham, these are smart guys. And they're fed up with this whole process, just like Bill Barr and, and a few others. So it, it's not going to get pretty. Michael Bloomberg has got tons of money, but I don't think, I don't think he can buy it. Uh, very liberal. Take the guns, pro-gay, pro all these things. He's done, he built a remarkable company. Got to give him credit there. But I don't think he can do it. Uh, the rumor now is Hillary is, looks good in the polls, but, you know, <laughs> things have come out about Hillary and Ukraine and Uranium 101 and these emails that got... Uh, a lot of, I, I think there's other ways to uh, the, the Hillary... <laughs> And I think that's just more, she hasn't had much attention lately, so I think that's really what motivates. What her. about Obama's wife? Hey, that, that, that's always, she, she didn't want to go back to, she could be difficult. 
She's a popular person. Um, you know, I don't think she wants the, the job, uh, Tommy, but uh, she would be formidable, but I, I don't think... What so. about Oprah? <laughs> it, it'd, be a, it'd be a pay grade loss, but uh, I don't think Oprah would be a... She'd rather fund them than be, be, be the president. Uh, I want to thank you because you introduced my next question, so here we go. Uh, the Horowitz came, report just came out, and I find it interesting that Durham and Barr have both been a little bit critical of it because they kind of say it doesn't go quite far enough. I'm from Salt Lake City. Horowitz is from Salt Lake City. Right. Do you know if he's LDS? Uh, I because don't. if that is the case, LDS people have a very strong tendency to be self-righteous. And that would, that would play into the way he reported this. Interesting. Uh, interesting. I haven't, uh, I don't, you know, there's Jews that are Horowitz. So uh, when I heard, I don't know if he's Jewish or, or Mormon, but right. uh, um, uh, yeah, there's some people pretty furious. He didn't go far enough. Uh, deep enough and for Durham to come out so quickly honoring what he was trying to do just says you know there's a lot more to this and it's going to come out and we well, just got to keep praying for John Durham and also Bill Bill Barr that nothing gets in the way of the truth of this being exposed and uh, I have a friend that knows Giuliani uh, Giuliani's got a lot more on this uh, he has to be a little bit more careful in his interviews and TV, uh, but nonetheless, he Giuliani's got a lot. I mean, he's not a fool. Uh, uh, so that I, I just think you know they, the Republicans have been, you know, it's like uh, one of the top writers from New York Post said you know Trump's uh, clever, you know very you know clever like a fox you know so. Uh, I think the Republicans just have been accumulating for the last three years content, information, and every time they, something starts surfacing, the, the Democrats get more offensive, trying to stop. I mean, uh, their aggressiveness in some ways is trying to keep some of this stuff off the front page of the newspapers, which would be if the Trump focus wasn't on them. They got a lot of stuff. I hope they use it when they need to, but I think they're going to do it. I would say next year, right before the election, probably be the most opportune time, uh, unfortunately. One, one other comment, and that is, being from Utah as I am, Republicans are extremely disappointed in Mitt Romney. I was just going to ask that. A lot of, I mean, in <laughs> fact, before he was ever elected, I'm involved in the Republican Party, and the debate came up, is he part of the swamp? And he's answered that question. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, I, don't, I don't think he can be trusted. I mean, his first interview in Washington, D.C. after being elected senator was with the Washington Post and CNN. I mean, outside of the New York Times, those are the three, they hate Trump more than anybody. And he goes and has interviews and talks about civility. He's positioning himself to be the candidate in 2020. I, I mean, I, I don't want to ever stay home for election, but I, don't, I could never vote for him after some of the things he's tried to pull off. And also thrown in the, you know, he blew the chance uh, that he had. I know God has his timing for everything, but uh, he really technically blew, blew his chance of being come the president just by doing some, some bad moves. Uh, he was very aggressive in his first debate with Obama, but the last two, he was, he was, he was terrible. He's a fake Republican. Yeah, I'm, I'm afraid you're right. Yeah. So last week, the Washington Post, or really this week, came out with a report uh, that investigated a lot of what's gone on in Afghanistan and found routinely that the military personnel had overstated goals that were achieved. And it's been a 20 year war that three presidents have been gain wanting to get us out of. Just what's the reaction from you and from DC in total? And then I have a. Well, the only, really, the only good thing about the Iraqi war is it moves things down the line prophetically. That, that's what it's done. It's moved things. The Iraqi war uh, led to Obama being elected, um, led to the Iran nuke deal, which led to Trump, which led to Trump being a great supporter of Israel. So you, you look at how everything falls into play. Our American presidents have had such a significant prophetic role when it comes to Israel and the Middle East, uh, all the way back to Truman. But I think the, the thing here is, Trump was, I mean, excuse me, George Bush was convinced, and Dick Cheney as well, that by some ex-Iraqi 
expatriates that they will be throwing rose petals at your feet. The Iraqi people will be throwing rose petals at your feet when you take down Saddam Hussein. They will honor you. And, and then this idea that you're going to democratize Arab countries. Oh my gosh, you convinced him of that. Uh, it's crazy. And then, um, uh, you know, speaking of God's timing for everything, uh, um, uh, Schwarzkopf was ready to go in and take Saddam down during Desert Storm. But Colin Powell told President Bush this would be a mistake, don't do it. Uh, and lobbied hard, Cheney lobbied hard to take him down. Cheney agreed with Schwarzkopf, and they had a big uh, meeting in the Oval Office. Uh, uh, Powell and Cheney left, and Powell circled back around and came back into the Oval Office and convinced President Bush not to go in and take Saddam down during the Desert Storm. So what happens uh, eight years later? Vice President, I mean, uh, Vice President Cheney. Once again, he's in that position, we've got to take down Saddam. And he convinced Bush, and Bush went along with it. And uh, unfortunately, they pretty much took down the Iraqi army, too. And then Iran just scooted right in. Scooted right in. The Ar Iraqi army cannot fight the Iranians. And now, unfortunately, a lot of the Iraqi army is pro-Iran. Uh, so it's all prophetic. Everything falls into place. Afghanistan, same thing. Mistake. Look, we spent six trillion. I mean, just think of the money that we've spent. And people. The, the, the six, seven thousand people that lost their life. That's small, tragic. It's too bad. But think of our other wars Vietnam, Korea, World War I, World War II. We lost tens of thousands of men and women. But, um, so, with all that said, um, this is prophetic fulfillment. Mistakes made by our uh, leaders have brought us to the point that we have an American president that very possibly might be put in a position to have to make a decision about Iran. Uh, and he might have to because of his great support of Israel. So I, I don't know. It's just everything is kind of falling into place prophetically uh, despite the mistakes. And, and what do you think of the effort, and I should know the name of this, but it's um, just Christian pastors signing up on a really full agenda of things and I think it's not called Common Grounds, which I thought was, I'm slipping the name, but uh, Common for 2000 or something like that. And it has things that address gun control in such a way that um, the right to bear arms exists, but not military grade weapons. And I think there's 20 some 30 points. And maybe the broader question is just, how does the church get involved in saying the agenda and making things happen? I, I mean, I, I think we sit back and complain, but what would be, or who is already doing good things to uh, move the ball forward in a Christ-like manner, if I can say it that way. Well, you know, we have, you know, unfortunately, as you all know, here in America, I mean, our uh, faith community is pretty, it's in a, it's in a bad shape. I mean, I, I watched uh, over the last 12 to 15 years um, the Protestants and Catholic position on uh, um, on. LG, I mean, homosexuality, uh, marriage, same-sex marriage, uh, to the point now we have 57% uh, of Catholics in favor of same-sex marriage and 63% of Protestants in favor of same-sex marriage. The evangelicals were at 20% now, I think it's up to 23% favor. That, you know, the evangelicals, I mean, we're the, the Genesis to Revelation guys. Um, uh, unfortunately, the, the liberal part of the church is becoming, they're looking to all kinds of solutions. What's interesting is the, 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 the liberal part of the church is really into social justice. But what's interesting, the same, uh, this, the, the social justice part of the, the liberal church is also, 65% uh, of our American church is also replacement theology. Uh, I added that up in 2004. We have 100 million church attendees in America that are going to replacement theology churches. And they're the ones that the Vatican has, has honored. They've called on Israel to leave the occupied land. They're the ones that have honored Palestine. They have a relationship with the Palestinians because a lot of Palestinian Arabs are now part of the Catholic, their Catholic bishops. So um, we, we have a lot of uh, challenges here in America. I mean, we, we, you know, our, huh, I'm hearing people on TV call themselves Christians that are in favor of same-sex marriage. You know, uh, the, the five on Fox, I mean, all of, there's a couple of people that call themselves believers there. They're all, they're all in favor of same-sex marriage. 
Um, you know, you see Christians that write for USA Today and other newspapers say they favor same-sex marriage, uh, LGBT. So, I mean, it's just, if we don't get back, uh, as mentioned to Dr. Kaiser today, I think Ed Heinsohn as well, if we don't get back to the biblical foundation and stick with the Word of God for what it says about all these things, I mean, we're doomed. Unfortunately, we're, we're, we're uh, uh, reaping the consequences right now of where uh, uh, the church is. And I mean, and George Barna says 1% of the millennials today have a biblical worldview. Well, why'd that happen? They didn't get it at home. They didn't go get it in church. So unfortunately, I mean, how, how does God get America's attention? Well, he can drive us to our knees. 9-11 almost did. 7 out of 10 Americans were depressed after 9-11. They flock back into the church only to leave shortly thereafter. We have less people attending to church today than at the time of 9-11. So I, I don't know. How's God going to get America's attention? I don't know. That or he just takes us, takes us home. I got a suggestion. Yeah. The rapture. <laughs> well, absolutely. I mean, that would be the quickest, cleanest, easiest for us. <laughs> but it would. I mean, America will be a third world rate power. It would take 30 million born-again believers, maybe more than that, or true Christians. America would come to its knees instantaneously after the rapture. And then also the final aliyah to Israel, the Jewish people who look to us now as their support, they would be out of here so fast right. because the evangelicals are gone. That was just a suggestion. That's a great one. Another one for us to pray about, Tommy. That's a well, well, thanks for your report and for these comments. I just want to add one thing with um, America being on the reserve currency, somewhat in the domain of what I do. Um, the problem with sanctions is we need to legally enforce those. When we legally enforce protection of our currency is what it would come down to, which could turn in isolating us and that the dollar would no longer be the reserve currency. And as you mentioned, that has humongo benefits for us that we're able to borrow at incredibly low rates and it goes on and on and on. So to the point where Russia and Iran recently were still trading in dollars, that everyone else has to do world trade in dollars. And um, as these countries peel off and um, China reducing our debt, which we don't have quite as much as the news seems to indicate, or, or they don't, um, and going more into euros, this is going to be a big change for us. So yeah, just, yeah, that's very interesting. You know, it was interesting, uh, December 17th, 2014, is the day the EU Parliament voted overwhelmingly in favor of a, the concept of a Palestinian state. That's the day the euro collapsed. Went from 125 to the dollar down to a dime. I mean, it went, went in a dime. Just like that. Thanks. Bill, we've got a uh, multi-billionaire in this world that's anti-Semitic towards Israel, that's anti-American, that, and you already know where I'm going with this, I guess. And uh, I've seen reports of how much companies in the United States that he owns or has controlling interest in, and a lot of it is the news media. What's your opinion on George Soros? Oh, you know, people, and call it, people that I know have been looking to him as the Antichrist for 20 years. Yeah. I mean, George Soros is um, a type and shadow of an antichrist. Not it. Um, I think they all have characteristics. Some of them are Obama, Tony Blair, others that are charismatic leaders that have influence. Uh, Soros is, uh, he, has, he helps fund the right-wing watch that goes after every Christian that says things biblically. Um, he, um, I was at the Man in Oriental two days ago for a meeting, and 72 hours after Trump got elected, uh, Soros had some of the wealthiest Democratic funders in America at the Orient Hotel for three days of the meeting. So how, do, how do we counter this Trump? They were absolute shock, but he had everybody at the Orient, uh, these big dollar guys, uh, doing everything they can. Soros is bad news. His hand, he is all over the world, you know. He's, he has a lot of influence. I won't go into a lot of detail, but if, I mean, there is so much on him from credible news sources that uh, he has a lot of influence. He has billions and billions, and he's using it. Open Society and all these subgroups, the Podestas work for him, do things for him. Uh, there's organizations. Uh, I think there's probably some things on the Internet to show all the organizations that he's part of or helps fund. And uh, he, he's, he's dangerous, and uh, he has bad history. Thank you. Real quick, uh, what do you think um, about the 
election coming up. Well, t Tommy, I... Uh... You know, like, do you think uh, in some of these states, like in the mid upper Midwest, that it'll be an honest election, or, do you, you know, yeah, I, what's I your... I think so. Uh, yeah, I think they will. A lot of times, we have Republican lawyers in almost every precinct in America at the elections. They, they follow them pretty carefully. But what about these, uh, we found this box of votes that we forgot to count, you know? Well, that, that, can, ha that can happen. Um, California is the one of the state that you're know, most concerned. Look at it. conservative Orange County, California is now, I think, mostly blue. Right. And, yeah, they, they stole were, five elections yeah, right. in that last, they yeah. got yeah. rid of. It, it's, 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 it's tough. Uh, they it's stole tough. five congressmen out of Orange County yeah, in the last Orange election. County. Um, um, I think, you know, isn't it amazing? Well, you know, you go, why, why are these elections so important? Well, because it's a, it's a, a sin agenda. Uh, we're, we're fighting against the sin agenda. I mean, the fact that we, we have 12 more years to, uh, uh, to get the climate right, or we're going to be history. Uh, I mean, this is, this is one of their rallying cries. I mean, you have Prince Charles, people that have some credibility. I mean, uh, and others are saying, we have 12 years to correct this. And this is, I mean, a lot of people believe this. that are uninformed. Um, you know, so that's a big deal. Um, uh, the LGBT agenda, the same-sex marriage, they, they're so, they're, they're, they are fighting for their agenda, and their agenda is evil, and this is a battle between good and evil. Right. That's why it's so ferocious right now, and we're at a point where there's no wiggle room. And we're trying to take our territory back, but once you lose uh, this territory, it's hard to get it back, especially in the sin issue. So I think it's just going to be continue to be divisive like this until something shakes America or the rapture uh, for the rest of our life, Tommy. I mean, it's just, it's bad, and it's deep. Um, uh, the Trump has helped expose a lot of this that wouldn't have been exposed otherwise. Right. Uh, which is, that's yeah. been another benefit. Of sure, it. if Hillary had won, we wouldn't be, oh, know we wouldn't of any of this. A lot of yeah. this we wouldn't know. And that's the thing I noticed when I was being at the White House when Obama was there. You know, his, his uh, press uh, advisors, his uh, uh, White House uh, advisor, secretary, press secretary, all the time would say half truth and say the truth just to captivate people, but never, never address the lie. Never address the lie. They're masters at hiding the lies. They're masters at hiding the falsehood. And that's, and that's what's difficult uh, in dealing with this media is they, uh, you'll, this stuff is getting out now because of Trump. And that's another benefit to having him in office. So with all that said, as I said tonight, my concern, 44 Republicans uh, with, with a lot of history didn't run in, in 2018. 19 right now are not running. Again, five in Texas. And we got to continue to keep those seats and gain some. Uh, but Trump also has to be careful. Um, uh, and Ari Fleischer said this, and I agree, is he's got he's to go beyond his base because he needs independent votes. And if you keep saying things just to feed your base and forget about the independents, you're, it's not going to be helpful. And uh, he probably lost four to seven seats in the last election because he didn't get the independents. A lot of those races were close, Dan, 100 votes, 1,000 votes. And he lost some independents that could have got us uh, Republicans more seats.